two, one. Good evening. This is Chairwoman Nikita Scott. And now I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, February 9th, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Mr. Mahumsa, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Good evening. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. In accordance with the mandated direction of the state superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call. Board members will say their names and while making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting a discussion on an agenda item. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the February 9th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? There are no changes or additions to tonight's agenda. Okay. So hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Um, excuse Ms. me. Ms. Scott, Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott, this oh, is Rod McMillian. Yes, Mr. McMillian. I would like to add something to the agenda or at least attempt to. Okay, yes, sir. I move the Baltimore County Board of Education allow board members the option of returning to live meetings on Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021. I okay. second that. This is Aaron Hager, if allowed. Okay, yes. Um, and Mr. McMillan, would you like to speak to your motion? I'm sorry, I brought is this, this a motion up. to add to the agenda or is this a motion? It's the motion, motion to add. Sorry. It's a motion to add to the agenda. You still want me to speak now? Yes, sir. Okay. I brought this up four or five months ago, maybe even longer. It was researched by the central staff. Uh, there was talk about, you know, going to Greenwood or going to the uh, the offices in Greenwood and to the dais and allowing a certain number of people to actually attend. So I want to I want to get that back on the agenda and talk about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. And it looks like um, Miss Causey, you have a comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to support Mr. McMillian's motion. I <clears throat> when <clears throat> I had worked to uh, facilitate his request and other board members' requests related to this, and I am certainly confident in the school system's um, mitigation protocols and the safety protocols, so I will be confident to attend in person um, if this passes. Okay, and Mr. Mahumsa? Yes, um, I, I am going to support this motion uh, just because I feel it's really important for us as board members uh, and even school leaders um, to lead by example 
and since we are going to um, mandate teachers to go back uh, pretty soon, I think it's just as important that for us to be back as well. Um, I, I don't know if this is the right time for uh, an amendment, but later on, I just want, wanted to make an amendment because I'm still unsure of the plan. I don't know if they released one um, last time we had the discussions, but I remember that there was going to be a plan presented about the safety um, protocols that were going to be, be put in place, then allow board members like a week or so um, the opportunity to review that plan, then um, allow board members to submit their pre preferences. Thank you for that, Mr. Mahomsa. Um, and I guess I would ask that, is this something that we should discuss um, during item L, um, the reopening of, of the schools? Um, I'm wondering if that would be the appropriate place for, for this um, to go. Um, Dr. Williams, would you care to weigh in on that one way or another? Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chairperson Scott. I just would, I think it is appropriate unless the board members want it as a separate item. We can incorporate it in the discussion during the reopening of schools. Okay, then. Um, so I guess then, um, Mr. Mercedes, my question would be then, is this something then that we would make a motion to add to item L or to table on, and then remake the motion during item L, um, what would be the best course of action? Is this with respect to Mr. Mohamza's amendment or, or actually it's uh, more of a separate motion? I wasn't aware Mr. Mohamza made an amendment. It was to Mr. Yeah. McMillian. Oh, you made a, an amendment, Mr. Mohamza? No, I didn't, make, I didn't make one because I don't think we can make one while we're adding an item to an agenda. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't think you made an, an amendment. I was thinking um, to Mr. McMillian's motion. Yeah, that could be added as either L1 or L2. OK, um, I guess I should ask Mr. McMillian, was your intention to have it added um, during the reopening of schools discussion? It really doesn't make a difference to me just as long as we discuss it and vote on it. Got it. OK, all right. Any other um, any other questions? Okay, hearing none. Um, Ms. Gober, could we take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Ms. Rowe? Oh. <laughs> yes. Ms. Kazi? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Could you let me know where to place that? Um. I think it should be placed with the reopening on item L. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And then, um, yep, we can address it there. And um, it looks like Ms. Clausey, you also had an item for agenda setting. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I move to suspend board custom such that motions can be processed during budget work session. As this is board custom and not a rule, I request the parliamentarian to specify how many votes are needed to pass this motion. And to uh, question, <clears throat> it's unclear to me whether the student member can vote since it is a budget item. So a uh, uh, point of order, are you asking a question or are you making a motion? It sounded like a combination. I'm making a motion. And then I had a question at the end for Mr. Bersades. Could you state your motion first? Yeah. I move to suspend board custom such that motions can be processed during budget work session. OK, could you also um, put that in the um, chat so that we can clearly have your language? Um, is there a second for that? Second row. OK. And would you like to speak to your motion, Ms. Causey? Yes, thank you. Um, I believe there are some issues that it would be helpful uh, 
that we can have motions at this session that may simply require more information um, or that would be helpful for um, the superintendent um, as we move forward so that the final meeting um, <clears throat> is not as lengthy and can be uh, more organized. Thank you. Ms. Jost, you have a question? Yes, I'm not clear as to what this motion is trying to do. Are you trying to add motions to this work session and more motions to the next work session? And um, it's just not clear what, what the motion's intent is because I would have liked to have seen some of those motions in writing at least before it comes through. This was a work session to the best of my understanding. So I'm confused what, what the agenda item is. Ms. Causey, could you um, speak to that, please? Uh, yes, I was surprised at the last meeting when we were not allowed to make motions. So I just wanted to clarify uh, if there's support of the full board that we would be able to process motions. Um, and it's in the chat. Thank you for that. And um, I would like to speak to that as well. Uh, it has been the custom under your chairwomanship for the past two years, um, as you repeatedly stated um, that we do not make motions during a work session. That's been the custom and the norm of the board. And that is a practice that you put into place that I would like to continue. Um, we can make motions at our next work session, which I believe will be on the 23rd. And um, but it's a work session to hear, to discuss, to ask questions. But I think that we need to continue with the practice that you set up and I as chairwoman would like to continue. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rowe. Oh, excuse me. I apologize. Um, uh, Dr. Hager and then Ms. Rowe. Um, did Ms. Jost have a question or? Ms. Jost had asked her question okay, and then sorry. I had you next. I didn't want to jump, no, it's fine. I didn't want to jump ahead. Um, I just wanted to clarify when, according to the way it's set up now, when would motions on the budget be made? Because it seems like everything's called a work session, so I was a bit confused about that. Certainly. Um, Ms. Gover, if you could confirm our next work session, um, is that the 23rd? I believe it is. But if that's also a work session, can motions be made then? Let's see. I'm checking now. Excuse um, me, Ms. Scott. I have on my calendar a work session for the 16th. Okay, so the work session is the 16th, and then then the next uh, meeting I, where we would make motions, it looks like it would be February 23rd. And that's, that's I believe, and that's I believe when we vote on the budget. But I just I, I just if, if there were a motion to be made, I just wanted to want, I was wondering based on the way it would operate now, when would that happen? Would it happen tonight next, on the 16th, the 23rd? Well, we don't Excuse make motions. Yes, I'm sorry. Is that Ms. Um, Ms. Gober? Yes, ma'am. There yeah. is not. There is not a budget work session that was scheduled for the 16th as of yet. Um, the 23rd is a consideration of the budget. OK, and that's where motions would be made. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So but don't sorry. I, I wrote down in my notes from the last meeting, though, that, that at that point the budget needs to go up onto the county. Um, anyway, it just seems it seems a little disjointed. It seems like we should make the motions then see the final product and then it goes on but I, I don't know how it's worked in the past so I'm just trying to understand how this works. Yes certainly so the way it's worked in the past is we have a work session where we work and we hear and we ask questions and then um, then it, we um, at, on the 23rd once that's done then um, we go on and we can make our motions there so we could also add a work session um, Ms. Max said there was one on the 16th, but there's not. But I mean, that is certainly something that we could add. Um, I apologize for the confusion. I had it on my calendar. Sorry. I also had it as a tentative work session. Oh, OK, good. I, at least I'm not losing my mind. Okay. <laughs> but again, that would be a work session. So I think that's where I'm confused. I, I thought that motions would be made at the meetings. So I, I I'm the meeting is the 23rd when the motions would be made, but the work session is to ask questions and to listen and to get information. And then we make motions at the actual meeting. Um, sorry, uh, Ms. Rowe? So I just wanted to state that 
it, there, there have been in past uh, budget cycles, the work session prior to the meeting that we vote on the budget was used to process budget motions in addition to the meeting that we actually vote on the budget. And the reason this was done is because the year prior to that, we were up till two in the morning hearing motions on the budget. And obviously we wouldn't want anyone who has a motion not to have their motion processed. So in order to avoid that, motions were heard at work sessions just for the budget. It's the only time we've ever done that at work sessions. So, um, you know, the board can change its rules or customs with a vote. So I don't think it's inappropriate for the board to, to decide if we want to process motions during a budget work session or if we want to wait until the day we vote on the budget to process what I think amounted to 25 motions at one budget meeting. The budget meetings have a lot of motions. Thank you for that, Ms. Rowe. And it looks like Ms. Hen has a comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that we schedule an open session on the FY22. The motion on the floor. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, Ms. On the floor. I apologize. We can Probably. come to that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if we could okay. return to mind when we're finished processing the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, we'll return back to you um, once we finish processing it. So were there any other questions um, about Ms. Qualty's motion? Okay. I have a comment, sorry. Sorry, who was, who, Josh. Thanks, Josh, go ahead. Yeah, um, and I think Ms. Hen was about to do, uh, answer what I was gonna uh, suggest, but I think we are a bit behind tonight and they are important matters and I don't think other board members were prepared for motions. So I, I, I think if I don't, I don't want to speak for Ms. Hen, but I think she was going to suggest scheduling a work session where they can proce process some uh, motions, and I think there'll be something that's more ideal. And correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Hen. That's correct, Mr. Mahamza, and I'll put my motion in the chat so we can return to it. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Hen, and thank you, Josh. All right, so I will restate Ms. Causey's motion. Um, it's as this is for Madam Chair, oh, I, I move to table Ms. Causey's motion and take Ms. Hen's motion first. Okay. All right then, so for tabling Ms. Causey's motion, taking Ms. Hen's motions first. Um, Ms. Hen, then could you state your motion? Oh, are you putting it in the chat? But could you state it, please? Sure. I move to schedule an open session on Tuesday, February 16th for discussing the FY2020 22 operating budget and processing related motions. Um, is there a second for Ms. Hen's motion? Second row. Okay. Excuse me, Excuse me Ms. Scott. Yes. Ms. Rowe had already moved to table, so we need to process that first, but I need a second for Ms. Rowe's tabling. Okay, is there a second? Yes, yeah, second Hen. Okay, and so now we would take a vote on tabling Ms. Causey's motion. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. You still there, Ms. Gilbert? Mr. Mr. Mahomza? Uh, yes. Thank you. Mr. Ackerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like the motion carries to table Ms. Causey's motion. So now we will um, process Ms. Hen's um, motion. Uh, Ms. Hen, could you repeat yes. your motion? Yes, Excuse thank me. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to schedule an open session on Tuesday, February 16th for the discussion of the FY 2022 operating budget and processing related motions. 
second row. Thank you. Okay, so now can we take a roll call vote on Ms. Hen's motion? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Covey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pester? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So it's a motion carries. And so now we can, um, we, oh, well, it was moved to table Ms. Causey's motion. Um, Ms. Causey, it sounds like it, you have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, so um, I would like to take the vote on my motion. I don't believe, uh, I appreciate Ms. Hen's motion and I voted for it. Um, it did pass, correct? So we'll be having that meeting on the 16th? Yes, it did pass. Okay, thank you. So, um, and I appreciate that. I do believe this is uh, one of the most important things and complicated, <clears throat> and we've had some challenges with the uh, cyber attack recovery. Um, so, but I don't believe that that precludes uh, making motions this evening. So I would ask that the vote be taken um, on my motion. Thank you. Point of order. Yeah, sorry, I go thought, ahead. I thought okay. we just tabled, sorry, Josh speaking. I thought we just tabled her. Motion. My motion is to table to take Ms. Hens first, not to not process it all together. Okay, sorry. But it was, but when, once something is tabled, then it is tabled and then we process it. We can process it at the end of the meeting or, or later on. So um, it, it was tabled. So I Mr. need to remove the item from the table and vote on it. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, so then now we can vote on Ms. Causey's motion and Ms. Calls, if you could restate your motion as you put it in the chat, please. Ms. Yes, Calls. I move to suspend board custom such that motions can be processed during the budget work session. Second, Mac. Okay, all right, thank you. And may we take a roll call vote on this, please? Excuse me, Ms. Scott, can I just clarify? Ms. Rowe um, took the motion from the table. Do we have to vote on that first? Mr. Mercedes, do we have to vote on Ms. Rose taking the motion from the table? Yes, Madam Chair. Oh, okay, then my mistake. All right, so it was moved that um, Ms. Rowe took um, Ms. Causey's motion. Well, she tabled it, but then she <laughs> removed it from the table. So now we're voting on um, removing it from the table. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Tester? I'm sorry, do you hear me? No. Ms. Tester, thank you. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Okay, and um, how many votes uh, do we need to, for that to pass? To keep it tabled? Mr. Mercedes? Uh, majority. So majority is seven? Yes. Okay, and how many do we have? Favor was five. So five in favor and then? The motion failed. Okay, so the motion fails. So then her motion is still tabled. Okay. All right, so then um, we're moving on. Um, so then basically, um, in accordance with um, 
I'm sorry, so we've added the changes to the agenda. And so the agenda um, has been um, changed. So in accordance with board policy 8314, a majority vote of the board is required to add or remove an item from the agenda. We've had discussion and may I have a roll call to confirm the revised agenda? I think the added item was already roll called. Oh, okay. Okay, so do we need to do a roll call to um, confirm the revised agenda or can we move on? No, we may move on. Thank you. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. One, to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. Nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations to consider matters that relate to the negotiations. And 15, discuss cybersecurity. If the public body determines that public discussion would constitute a risk to one, security assessments or deployments relating to information resources technology, two, network security information, or three, deployments or implementation of security personnel, critical infrastructure or security devices. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. So the next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for that I call on Ms. Lowry. Good evening Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters. Retirements, resignations, leaves, deceased recognition of service, and consideration of the Southeast Area Education Advisory Council appointment. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D5? So moved, moved Mac. Do I have a second? Second. And who did the seconding? Ms. Hen. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Any discussion? Oh, it looks like Dr. Hager, you have a question? Um, I just had a quick question about the Southwest Area um, Council um, nomination, just because I recall there being a discussion around not having a student um, who had volunteered to sit on the Southwest Area Advisory Council. And so, is it possible to fill those positions throughout the year or is it kind of a one time opportunity? I believe Ms. Hager, there is another opportunity that is coming up where the students would have an opportunity. OK, thank you. I just saw, saw that someone came in at this time of year and so it seemed like potentially an opportunity that we wouldn't want someone to miss out on. So thank you for that. Sure thing. Ms. Smith? Ms. Lowry, can you provide um, guidance to the full board in email as to how that will take place? Um, I actually have had some discussions this week about this that very issue about a student on the Southwest Advisory. So um, if you could outline a timeline and what steps that a student would have to take, um, I would appreciate it. I think the Southwest and there was another area that did not have a student either. Yes, we can follow up with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomes? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Tester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. 
The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams. So good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the board. I would like to recommend uh, Ms. Lisa Wilson Young to the position of manager in the Office of Logistics. Uh, she would be new to Baltimore County Public Schools. She brings experience at LifeBridge Health as a manager, also MedStar Health as a manager of supply chain management. She worked at Creative Business Solutions as well as Lockheed Martin. She also has 12 years of service in the United States Army. So I present to you Ms. Lisa Wilson-Young as the new manager of the Office of Logistics. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointment as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Ro. Do I have a second? Past your second. Thank you. Any questions? Ms. Gober, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is public comment. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens as appropriate. We will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow up by his staff. The board is currently accepting written public comments. The board discourages comment on specific student or employee matters, comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County and inappropriate personal remarks. The school system is committed to accessible communication with its stakeholders. Comments from stakeholder groups and other members of the public may be emailed to boe at mybcps.info. The board reserves the right to disseminate public comments through board docs as long as one submitter specifically requests their comments be published as part of the public record. Two, the comments adhere to the board's stated guidelines. Three, the comments include the name of the submitter. And four, the comments have been received before 11.59 p.m. on the Monday before the board meeting. So the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. And for that, I call on Dr. Daryl Williams. So once again, good evening, everyone. Since the development of our new strategic plan, the Compass, our pathway to excellence, and the board approval of the Compass in July of 2020, um, decided to share my plans to operationalize the new strategic plan specifically around the five focus areas. In order to do this work, we must shift how we do the work even during this pandemic, uh, which of course does not provide optimal conditions for our students and staff. However, my focus has been clear about student outcomes and professional development, and there is an urgent call to action so beginning this school year, I have created system improvement teams known as SIT as one way to have ongoing discussion, analysis, and change in practice at the central office level and at the school level. So the system improvement team framework uh, is comprised of team members of school-based and central office members who meet to review district progress and collectively plan opportunities to showcase school teams and best practices during meetings such as our principal leadership development meetings. Specifically, the team will analyze available data and observe trends for both quantitative and qualitative data points. Frame the current state, identify questions to investigate, identify specific measurable objectives, 
have access to resources and central office staff and develop communication plan to share findings, recommendations to practices and interventions and next steps. So currently we have 11 system improvement teams and the focus areas are as follows. There's a reading SIT team, Algebra 1. There's a SIT team for GT Honors, AP and IB. Another team for PSAT, SAT, ACT and Accuplacer. Ineligibility is the next one. College and career readiness focusing on graduation. College and career readiness focusing on CTE. Suspension, staffing, family engagement and fiduciary responsibilities. Each system improvement team will be required to develop a charge statement based on the topic and will analyze data to determine the action plan. Uh, of course, the action plans must be based on need analysis, address the underserved, underserved student groups and include an evidence based intervention and acceleration. Each system improvement team will determine the deliverables and goals based on the data analysis and will schedule regular meetings to accomplish this work. So in order to improve student achievement, Marzano research says improving outcomes for students requires improving the systems and schools that serve them. And we, the staff at the central office and school based level must work together to identify and implement those best practices that are going to gain increases in our student performance. We will continue to focus on the student teacher staff and the school leadership with the collaboration of the other divisions to affect change in the classroom in every school. Later uh, this evening, we will provide an update on our reopening plan, so I will leave those comments until then, but I would like to acknowledge two of our educators this evening. Anjanine Good is the library media specialist at Catonsville High School, and she was honored with the Minority Recognition Award for Community by the Maryland State Education Association Board of Directors and Minority Affairs Committee and Camille Gibson, who is an art teacher at the Golden Ring Middle School and department chair and visual art lead teacher for our East Zone schools. She was named Eastern Region Middle Level Art Educator of the Year by the National Art Education Association. And of course, this month is to honor the history of African Americans in our country. We are recognizing Black History Month through a series of stories about Black history in Baltimore County, including our former leaders, as well as our current students, families, and staff. In addition, our curriculum offices held our annual Black History Month writing contest, and this year's Black Saga program will allow teachers to engage in an unlimited number of students for the first time due to the virtual and soon hybrid format. Thank you, and this concludes my report. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Williams. Um, next is the chair, the board chair's report. And um, considering <laughs> the lateness of the hour of which we started, um, I would just like to thank everyone who joined us, all of our parents, our students, our stakeholders for um, sticking with us. I know we have a lot of important things to get to and to discuss, so I am not going to take up very much time with my uh, chair remarks, but I want to thank you all for, for joining us and um, I will um, then pass it on to the next agenda item, which is student member of the board report, uh, Mr. Mahomza. Yes, uh, good evening, Madam Chair, uh, Madam Vice Chair, Dr. Williams and fellow board members. Uh, I'm, all, I'm also going to keep my uh, comments tonight relatively short so that we can uh, get to the important topics on tonight's agenda. Uh, since my last uh, report to the board, I've had the privilege to attend uh, multiple events and uh, meet with students and teachers from around the county, discussing uh, many topics that range from equity, uh, uh, school reopening, athletics, student advocacy, and our curricular. Uh, most notably, I want to thank uh, TABCO, uh, the Baltimore County uh, Student Council's uh, Pikesville, Paul, 
podcasts and the many uh, stakeholders that have reached out uh, via email and have requested to have one-on-one -on -one, uh, Zoom sessions and phone calls uh, with me. I have to say uh, the most rewarding experience of this unpre unprecedented uh, year has to be uh, the profound uh, correspondence and uh, virtual meetings that I've had with our stakeholders. Uh, speaking of my term, uh, since my last update, uh, when I announced uh, that applications were open uh, for next year's uh, student board member, uh, I'm happy to announce that uh, the selection committee, which included uh, student council members, high school and middle school principals of the year, teachers, and uh, myself uh, chose the students who would move on uh, to the interview round. We were able to conduct the interviews last week and we chose the two individuals who will fill uh, my seat next year. I want to congratulate uh, those uh, those that applied for the position, especially uh, those that commenced to the interview and the final round. Each of our applicants were uh, highly successful and showed uh, tremendous uh, professionalism. The announcement of the final candidates will be released tomorrow. I want to uh, personally thank our chair, Ms. Scott, for giving me uh, and my uh, position being the student board member the honor of serving as vice chair of the legislative committee. At the time where uh, SMOBs around the state are defending uh, their value and fighting for their voting rights, it means a great deal that our board, through the leadership of our chair, values the contribution uh, of our SMOBs and recognizes uh, the unique contribution uh, that we can provide to the board. Uh, I look forward uh, to uh, talking to board members about uh, my work and the work of the legislative uh, committee, uh, which is uh, chaired by Ms. Pasture, who has been a great mentor uh, to me throughout this year, and especially this past couple of months. Tomorrow, uh, from 12 to 1 p.m. our student councils will be hosting an equity summit on uh, Google Meets. This event uh, has been open to students and school leaders but has a limit of uh, 250 individuals. Uh, the code for this event can be found on BCPS social media platforms uh, but individuals must have uh, BCPS, BCPS credentials uh, in order to be admitted in. Finally, uh, in recognizing uh, Black, Black History Month, I, I want to thank our school system and our educators who have continued uh, promoting inclusivity and have worked to identify the gaps, whether it, uh, it concerns race, gender, socioeconomic level, um, and other and the other um, classes, and implementing solutions so that we don't leave uh, none of our uh, learners behind. I'm going to paraphrase uh, from my comments uh, during the TAPCO MAC event where I said um, every student has their unique strengths and disadvantages. My hope is as we continue our discussion on curricular uh, behavior and all and all the other matters that relate uh, that affect equity, that we don't ever look down on our students, that we have many students in our school system uh, that want to be successful, but because of circumstances that are at times not their fault, um, they struggle and those are the students that we need to really focus on as we continue our discussions on uh, equity. I want to, uh, again, BCPS has done a great job these past couple of months and uh, the past couple of years. And I just hope that we continue with the momentum. And I know this board has done great work uh, with uh, the support of the previous chair and the current chair. And I thank uh, uh, you all for that. And that's the conclusion of my uh, report. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Mohamza. Um, so the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Mercedes. Good evening, Madam Chair. The board previously met in closed session to hear oral argument in case number HE 20-47. Now would be an appropriate time to confirm the board's action taken at that time. Okay, may I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session and authorize Ms. Gilbert to sign the order on behalf of the board? So moved, Ms. Causey. Is there a second? Second, Mac. Thank you. Any discussion? Ms. Gilbert, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? 
Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Faster? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and it looks like the next item on um, the agenda is contract awards. And for that, I call on Ms. Jose, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Earlier today, Madam Chair, the Building and Contracts Committee met and bring forth recommendation for approval of contracts one through 12. Contract 13 is presented for information only. As you're aware, the board has taken, has asked that the contracts for all of its cybersecurity vendors be taken through the normal BNC process so that the public is aware of the services provided to the board during the ransomware attack. There are four contracts presented for approval and one that is presented for informational purposes. The legal services contract for McDonald Hopkins LLC, a law firm with expertise in cybersecurity, is provided for informational purposes only. Based upon recent advice from the county attorney's office under section 4104B of the education article, the school board may retain counsel to represent it only for legal matters involving disputes with the Baltimore County government. Under 4104B, the school board does not have authority to approve contracts for legal services involving outside counsel. This, of course, concerns legal contracts with outside counsel to handle cybersecurity matters. As such, this contract with McDonald Hopkins LLC to provide legal counsel for the board, which is currently before the board, must have authorization from the county attorney. The contract for McDonald Hopkins to provide legal services for the board has been approved by the county attorney. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Jones. And do I have a motion to approve items K1 through K12? Madam Chair? Yes. Would you please separate items K Nine through K twelve. K nine through K twelve. Okay, so you want to approve item? Well, I, I mean, so we're separating them out for discussion. So then we would first look at items K one through K eight. Is that correct, Miss Hen? Was that your intention? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so then do um, I need to restate that then do I have a motion to approve items K1 through K8? Dr. Hager has a question, I believe. Oh, uh, apologies. Yes, um, go ahead, Dr. Hager. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm not on this committee and um, and this this one caught my eye a bit just because there were so many of them and they the total um, amount was so high across the board for these contracts. Um, so I, I dug a little bit in more and I, I wanted to know if someone could explain the cut sheet paper contract in particular just because it seems such like such a dramatic difference um, compared to what's typically spent. Um, I don't know if there's an anticipation that next year we're going to really increase our paper distribution um, in, compared to previous years, or if there's something more to that, if someone could explain that. Mr. Saris, you can go ahead and, and give that explanation as it relates to the contract. Uh, yes, the uh, prior year and current year expenses are dramatically lower due to the school closure and uh, typically we do spend uh, about 1.3 million dollars annually and so uh, the prior 
history here is not uh, doesn't provide a lot of uh, insight onto the contract. Uh, on the bright side, we're saving a lot of money. And that, that kind of leads me to, I, I wondered if that was the case. Um, so this is yet another example of kind of, of savings that we'll have from the current situation. And so um, remind me again, kind of what happens in, the, in this case um, as we find areas where we're not spending as much money as anticipated. Will that roll over into the next year? Will we have to spend that out this year to make us whole? Well, we, uh, we never have to spend it but we may very well want to move money around to offset some of the costs of the uh, cyber attack recovery or school reopening, et cetera. And that would take place in April when, we, uh, when the board considers the annual budget appropriation transfer or BAT. Okay. And, and the, well, if we weren't, things- if it, it weren't spent, then it would roll into the county's uh, fund balance. The the county, not the school system. It, it's in our it's on our account general ledger, but it can only be spent once it rolls over. It can only be appropriated with approval of county council. Got it. Okay, thank you. That that really helps a lot. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Mr. Saris, this is Russ Kuhn. I, I have a question on the same contract. Why is it only for one year? Uh, we have never uh, been able to get uh, any vendors to give us multi-year pricing on paper just because of the somewhat volatile market. So we and the other counties that we've cooperated with in the past, Anne Arundel and in this case, Montgomery County uh, have uh, consistently done a one year bid. Thank you. I appreciate yes. that. Um, Ms. Chair, Ms. Scott, I, I have questions for multiple contracts. Are we going to like start a motion and then have a discussion or, or do we just ask our questions now? Um, I would like to get um, advice from Mr. Brusades on that. Do we need a motion to discuss the contracts as they've been separated out, or um, do can we just have discussion now? It's my understanding that uh, a motion was made by Ms. Hen, was it, to separate out the K. K1 to K8, K8. Um, and then she's, uh, K9 to K12. Right, uh, and 13 is just a, a information item. Uh, it, it would seem a- appropriate. Well, well, first there needs to be. There wasn't a second. Is there, is there, is there consensus on that? Um, well, Ms. Hen made a motion and then um, there wasn't a second. Oh, Madam six. Chair, I, I asked for those to be separated. It wasn't a formal motion. Normally, we ha- you would make a motion to um, or ask for a motion to approve K1 through K8 and then a separate for K9 through K12. Okay, so I did make I um, did make a motion, so it was not seconded. Um, so is it now an appropriate time to have discussion or do I need to make the motion again? I would make the motion again for approval of K1 through K8. And okay. Unless there's other folks of other board members who have questions. Was that Mr. Kuhn? Who had that was questions? what Mr. Kuhn was asking, yes. Yes. Uh, then I would say bundle the questions for K1 through K8. Prior to um, the motion being that I made being seconded? Correct. Okay. Okay, so then board members can, um, I guess, bundle the questions through K1 through K8. And then we'll go to K9 through K12. So are there additional questions for K1 through K8? I just Um, had a comment on K5, Madam Chair. Yes, and who is speaking, Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank Mr. Saris um, for providing the information about the contract that was replaced by this contract, um, CWA 12520, 
on cut sheet paper and I was able to locate that contract and find that the prior expenditures were, I believe it was around 1.3 million. So that was able, I was able to answer the question that Dr. Hager had posed by locating the prior contract. So that was information that had been added to the new template or relatively new template for, um, requested by building and contracts. So thank you, Mr. Saris, for providing that information. You're very okay. welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Looks like we have a comment from Ms. Causey on item number eight. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I had a question related to this because this same contract had come to us, I believe, a month ago for a million dollar um, increase modification of spending authority. And so I just wanted to hear why um, this was being increased again so soon. Yes, I'm happy to address that question. Um, we uh, brought a contract for $1,505,000 uh, to the board in December, and that was the initial uh, response to the ransomware attack. And uh, of that total, uh, $1.4 million was a fixed price agreement uh, that allowed us to uh, move our ERP system uh, into the cloud. So uh, that, prog that project was undertaken in December and uh, has been uh, uh, the system has been moved and set up now uh, and hosted by CGI in their cloud based services. Uh, that same contract also included about a hundred thousand uh, dollars that was an estimate for consulting support that we might need to get the project going. Um, and of that 750 hours, uh, we have used beyond that now up to 875 hours uh, just to get us through the first uh, first two payrolls uh, on the uh, the new system, and we have uh, worked with CGI uh, on an estimate for the remaining work that they project over the next year. Uh, and that, uh, as we say in the exhibit, is approximately 3,500 hours or $525,000 that would uh, bring the project uh, through to completion based on our best estimates. So uh, bring us to steady state and restore all of the capabilities that we had previous uh, which uh, include uh, numerous interfaces and reporting capabilities uh, that provide full functionalities. Thank you for that explanation. And in the previous spending authority... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, and I'm sorry, um, Ms. Causey. Okay, I apologize, go ahead. Thank you, Ms. I didn't mean to interrupt you, I apologize. Oh, no, that's OK. Um, so um, it, in a previous in the previous spending authority, correct me if I'm wrong, it had said funding source operating budget and also um, insurance. But this one only indicates operating budget. Could you break down the information for us and maybe um, in terms of what is covered by the cyber insurance? So we have uh approximately $5 million in coverage. Uh, the There is uh, up to $2 million in coverage for direct costs. And uh, you'll note that the five agreements uh, at the end of the contract agenda total about 1.3 million. And uh, there is an additional six hundred thousand or so in potential coverage 
Um, but at this point, we uh, we do not know if any of that will be covered by insurance. And so uh, we are just planning to use existing resources, uh, although we will make application to have this covered. Uh, the primary con five contracts will be covered because they were all vendors approved by the insurer. So um, we're prepared, uh, we, we're hopeful, but prepared to uh, fund this in any event. Okay, thank you. So the <clears throat> the dollar amounts, um, I couldn't add them up in my head, but uh, so this contract is not covered any longer by insurance. We don't know that. We will make application, but because it wasn't the initial group of five that were brought in by the insurance company, we're not sure how the insurer will uh, will consider a claim for part of these costs. We know that uh, they will not cover an enhancement to our services. So the portion of the contract that entails the move to the cloud would be considered an enhancement, um, but we may get coverage for the consulting portion of the contract that uh, is helping us do the remediation. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next we have Mr. Coon. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Saris, I'm gonna stay with this, um, this specific item for a moment. Uh, something you just said, um, I, I think that we should challenge uh, with our insurance carrier, um, regardless of where we stand up the software that we're recovering, whether it's in the cloud or it's on premise, uh, that's not an enhancement. So I, I would I would suggest that um, you know we we apply the insurance company because uh, they need to recover us to 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 working. Uh, to a working situation. Um, then, my, so my follow-on question really with this amount here, because it continues to increase. I mean, we've you we voted on this as, as, as recently as uh, December 22nd. Um, you know, we're up to $12.5 million. And my question for you is, is this the vehicle that you're expecting to basically um, uh, manage all of the spending associated with um, the recovery outside of insurance? Is this is this the contract you're expecting to use to support and pay for that activity? Uh, no, we have other services that I believe um, either were shared or will be shared with the board in an update regarding uh, other costs related to the attack. This is strictly for our ERP system software. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, now um, I would like to ask you questions about uh, number seven, the solar power purchase agreement. Yes, that is something that Mr. Dixit will be able to respond to. Fantastic, thank you. OK. Hello, hello, Mr. Dixit. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> um, this is over you know, nearly a $10 million line item, um, and it's for a 20 year contract, and there are not really many details here. For instance, I have no idea what uh, kilowatt per hour price that we're going to be spending uh, over 20 years um, based on this. Can you please give us the background uh, for this? Sure, I'll be glad to. So what board has in front of you is a contract for 20 years that will be reviewed by our law office and any construction will be reviewed by our uh, engineers to make sure that it is done right. So what the contract entails is for the vendor to install uh, a system that will generate 
uh, solar uh, power and be able to sell it to us at a at a at a pre agreed upon price. The price uh, will vary from 7.6 cents to 9.2 cents over a period of 20 years, which is very competitive, which uh, uh, in the beginning saves at least a penny, approximately a penny over the existing price that we are paying. So to give you some idea of the quantity, this plant will be generating about 6.5 million kilowatt hour. So if we save a penny, uh, we are going to be saving about 60 to $65,000 per year. But the electricity commodity prices, they fluctuate. So we really don't know at this point whether they are going to go up or go down in this period. But it guarantees us stabilized price for the period of 20 years. Uh, the total quantity that we need or we, uh, or we consume is about 150 million kilowatt hours. So this is approximately 4% of the total consumption. The reason we want to support this because this is cost effective, at least right now, it provides a stable prices over a period of 20 years, and it helps us meeting the legislative requirement of approximately 50% of the portfolio to be um, renewable energy by 2030. So I said a lot. If I missed anything, let me know and I'll try to clarify. No, I, I would suggest that this is an exciting project of possibility. It's it's very limited on items and details for us, and it looks like um, the design isn't even it's not there yet. So, um, you know, I'm, although I would love to support it, uh, it, it seems kind of like a, a a line item that just doesn't have the detail necessary yet. So I'm, I'm conflicted, to be honest with you, uh, to, to support this item uh, at this point. Um, and and I don't even know, and one of my questions was going to be, do does this include like electric like storage um, where the, the electricity generated is stored and then we can use it because the buses aren't any facilities, you know, unless they're going to be using the electricity generated, we're going to have to feed it back into the grid and then take some price sharing there. So I'm trying to understand this. Yeah, and I'll try to help you with that. So the electricity will be used for the facility and we'll have a contract with BGE or the company, the vendor will have a contract to pump back the electricity that we do not use there to be able to use in our other accounts. So while we are not storing any electricity, we are using all of the 6.5 million kilowatt that we are generating at a cheaper price in a sustainable manner. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Thank you. Did we have um, additional questions? And um, if not, then I move that we uh, approve contracts K1 through K8 um, doesn't require a second since it comes to the committee. And now I guess we'll process K9 through K12. Um, so Mr. Mercedes, you said because um, we separated them out, so we did K1 through K8. That's been moved. Now would I make a motion then to move K1 through, excuse me, K9 through K12? Has the, has the board voted on approving K1 through 8 yet? No, you're right. I need to take a vote since, okay. May I have a roll call vote? Thank you for that. Ms. Gover? I need a motion. To move. Uh, I moved it. I said I move that we approve contracts K1 through K8. Thank Madam you. Chair, this is Ms. Causey. I had put in the chat asking if we could separate out the solar contract. After I made the motion, is uh, that appropriate? Yes. Was it? Well, I, I had put it in before you made the motion, but it, has it been seconded yet? I don't believe it needs a second. No it second is needed. It comes from the committee. So I had moved that we 
vote on um, K1 through K8 as separated um, per Ms. Chen. So since there's a motion on the floor, then um, I believe the appropriate steps would be to vote on that motion. Is that correct, Mr. Mercedes? Or Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. So Ms. Gover, can we do a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Excuse me? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Fazi? Abstain. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Mahamsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? Abstain. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor is seven. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll move to K9 through K12. Um, is there any discussion on K9 through K12? Okay, do I have do I have a motion? Oh, um, I apologize. Uh, yes, Miss um, Jose and then Miss Causey. Miss Jose. Oh, Miss Scott, I do not have any questions. Mine was just a yes to Miss uh, Mr. Kuhn. Oh, okay. Um, Miss Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Could we separate out these contracts? You want to separate out all nine contracts? Well, wait a minute. You want to separate, I'm sorry, K9 through K12? Yes. And to process them each individually? Which one is the contract that is just for, um, there was one that was stated was just for information that was not for approval? That's, uh, yeah, number, if you're in board docs, that's number 13. So we're doing 9 through 12, we're grouping them because they're around the same um, subject area. So we're grouping them together. So do you have a question about K9 through 12? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I do have questions about 9 through 12 and if we could separate out 13. So um, 13 is separated out already because it's for informational purposes, um, but we're and we're not voting to approve that. Miss um, Joe had said it was for informational purposes and then but we need to vote first to approve 9 through 12. So do you have any questions on 9 through 12? Yes, I do. OK, please proceed. So. The Department of Legislative Services performed a uh, legislative audit of Baltimore County uh, of the Board of Education of Baltimore County and the school system. The final report was dated November 19th, 2020 and was released to the public uh, a few days after that. In it, there are a number of findings related to procurement, and I just wanted to confirm uh, that one of the findings that has been repeated is that um, procurements were not always made, I'm reading from the report. Furthermore, procurements were not always made in accordance with established policies or applicable state law. Specifically, BCPS did not ensure that contracts were properly executed prior to payment as required by its policy and uh, did not publish the awards. Um, in addition, BCPS did not maintain sufficient supporting documentation of purchases uh, to enable us to determine whether BCPS received the best value. So my questions relate to the timing of these purchases. It's my understanding that uh, all of them have been enacted uh, since maybe November, uh, maybe December, and the board, um, these contracts only came in front of the board um, two weeks ago and needed to be reviewed by the county attorney. So I'd like to understand, is there a purchase order that's already been done? 
and how is this in alignment with uh, procurement laws, especially given the repeat findings in the OLA report? Uh, this is Mr. Saris. Um, these are emergency contracts, and uh, as such, uh, they were executed uh, in response to the uh, cyber attack and presented to the board at the next earliest opportunity. And while they weren't on the uh, open agenda they were discussed in closed session at the earliest opportunity with the board and uh, they are also different in the respect that uh, if we want to take advantage of the insurance policy coverage uh, the a provision of that policy um, requires that they that they that we use vendors approved uh, by the company in order to get the greatest advantage of the policy so uh, this was not a typical situation where we we do a 90-day bid uh, evaluate proposals uh, as we would with any other contract Thank you for that. Next, we have Ms. Hen. Thanks, I'm, sorry, Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Scott. I, I just wanted to clarify. The board had a meeting December 7th. So there was an opportunity and uh, and it, it is known because of the opening part of that meeting that cyber security was discussed. So that was a meeting that was uh, point of order, Ms. Uh, Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Kazi is conflating two different issues. This is a different contract, the ransomware. It has nothing to do with the OLA uh, audit that came through. And um, this is an emergency contract like Mrs. Sarah so succinctly clarified and explained in the building and contracts and here. To keep conflating the two is confusing and uh, there's a basic lack of understanding of how contracts work, it seems like. Um, this is not relevant to the OLA. This is an emergency contract that came through due to the ransomware attack the system faced. So, Mr. Uh, Saras, thank you for your explanation. So, thank you for that. Um, what I was going to say is related to emergency contracts, and I've reviewed this because of COVID, there are timelines and deadlines that are uh, required to be followed. And my point is that the board did have a meeting December 7th uh, where this could have been brought forward. We had another okay. meeting December 22nd. Um, also, Ms. Kelsey, I'm sorry, is, I believe Ms. Time is up. Your, your time yeah. is up. Yeah, so we want to make sure I, um, we get to everyone because, um, again, we have a lot of important issues that we need to get to and to talk to, Ian. Um, we want to make sure that everyone has an ample time to speak. So, if Thank you could you. Other go point forward. Mr. Sarah, I, I'm sorry, Ms. Scott, I could. I, I'm sorry, excuse me, not. board members, please, if everybody could stop speaking. Okay, we cannot <laughs> go into... Um, we, we need to remain civil and respect everyone's time. So, in order to run an orderly meeting, we need to adhere to the time, ask your questions, and then we need to move on. Ms. Hen is waiting patiently, and I would like Ms. Hen to have the opportunity to speak. Ms. Hen, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is for Mr. Brusades. Given that these are emergency procurements and that the contracts were executed prior to them being brought to the board, my question has to do with whether or not there are any consequences to the board not approving these contracts. In other words, what is the significance of these um, being approved by the board now? And are there, can you offer us some legal advice regarding providing retroactive approval? Is this necessary? Should the board not approve these contracts given that they were already executed? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Han. That uh, sounds like a very complicated question, and unfortunately, I would be uh, loath to give you an off-the-cuff response at this point. Thank you, Mr. Brusades. Um, Mr. Sears, perhaps you could comment on that from a procurement standpoint. Uh, I, I think it's better left for the many lawyers present to address those questions. Well, 
will work work will not stop if the board does not approve these contracts is is that correct work has started work continues i don't know the status of the work in each of these instances um i i believe though that if they're uh that the risk uh the greatest risk is just that the uh insure we would lose the insurance coverage and just be liable on our own for whatever these services were mr mercedes okay. is there anything you would like to add nothing to add at this point thank you thank you madam chair thank you miss hen next we have miss jose yeah, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, quick, and I, and I don't know if you can answer it. Will the board not approving these insurance contracts, since th this is um, a rare, would that affect our insurance claims? Is that something um, Mr. Mercedes or anybody could answer? Because it seems like this is not a regular contract. It's related to the insurance claims as well, and the board not approving this. And Ms. Ms. Hen, you were the chair when these contracts came in December and you sent it back to the county uh, lawyer to look through it. And he sent it back with the recommendation that the board could approve it. So I am a bit confused as to why um, now all of a sudden there is all these questions because you were aware of these contracts. You sent it back. They were removed from the Building and Contracts Committee. And uh, my question again is if this board given the past decides not to approve this, how does that affect our insurance claims? Because this is covered by insurance. So so board members need to keep that in mind before you vote no on this contract, that it could possibly affect our insurance claim. I'm not sure I'm not a lawyer. Is there anyone who can answer that for Ms. Jose and for, for the rest of us? Is there any member of staff, Dr. Williams, or um, perhaps our legal counsel that could um, answer so, that for us? So good evening, Ms. Uh, Ms. Scott, board members, as to whether or not this would, uh, or the board's failure to ratify uh, these agreements, these emergency agreements would affect the insurance. I've not done that analysis, but you've already been advised in closed session about these agreements. Uh, you were advised uh, in December and uh, to the best of my knowledge, there are no surprises in the scope of any of the work that is being presented. It was the board's directive that these come to uh, and through the Building and Contracts Committee. And staff is complying with the request that the board make and the director of the board. Thank you for that, Ms. Howie. Um, Mr. Koo? Yeah, so I just I wanted to clarify something and, and I believe it it has been stated, but I just want clarification. The contracts in question are all fully covered by our insurance policy. Is that is that accurate, Mr. Saris or whoever? The services from these vendors, yes, sir, they are covered as long as we use these vendors. They're approved by BC. All right, thanks. Madam Chair, I had a follow up question for Ms. Howie. Uh, there are uh, legal timelines for emergency procurement. Um, I had uh, a link that is not working. Uh, so is fiscal services staff aware of what those emergency procurement deadlines are? I'm sure the staff in the uh, Department of Fiscal Services, particularly in the uh, Office of Purchasing, are aware given that they've won national awards about their work. Thank you. So. My understanding was it was 45 days. Is that correct? I confess, ma'am, that I do not have the exact date in my head. Okay. 
Thank you. So um, do I have a motion to approve items K9 to K12? So moved, Ro. Thank you. No second is needed as it comes from the committee. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Cosby? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. M Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Abstain. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes, I'm sorry. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Abstain. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favors nine. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gilder. Okay, and um, the next item on the agenda is the reopening of schools, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams. So good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, and members of the board. This evening, I will provide an update on the reentry into a hybrid setting for Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, this will outline our current work as a system and in our schools. Uh, this evening, we have members of our design team present. And if I can have the PowerPoint. Thank you. As you can see, we have members of our design team, Dr. Zarchin, Dr. Scriven, Dr. Boswell McComas, our community, two of our community superintendents, Dr. Jones and Dr. Roberts, and Ms. Lowry, our acting chief of human resources. Next slide, please. As you're aware, MSDE approved a phase in plan for groups of students in a hybrid setting. Additionally, our plan always included an option for families to have students remain in a fully virtual pathway. This slide illustrates the dates of reentry for that approved plan. March 1st, 2021, our students at our public separate day schools, phase one, and our students in preschool through grade two, phase two, will reenter in a hybrid model. Our students with special needs who are served predominantly outside of the general education setting and select CTE students will reenter on March 15, 2021. After receiving feedback from schools, BCPS divided phase four into two groups in order to support our students in critical transitional years. Our students in grades six and nine will return on March 22nd, 2021. This will allow students in these grades to become acclimated to a new setting. On April 6, 2021, the Tuesday we return from spring break, the remainder of the students in grades three through five, seven through eight, and 10 through 12 will re-enter. Next slide, please. On Thursday, January 28th, 2021, our school, uh, school administrators and, and their re-entry teams received extensive professional learning to support the development of a school-based re-entry plan. Their school-based plan, plans are aligned to the three parts of our re-entry plan health and safety, system and school operations, and instructional models. Next slide. School teams were provided work plans that would enable them to create parallel plans to the BCPS reentry plan that outlines the how of implementation. This is just a snapshot of the school implementation plan. Next slide, and this, I'm happy to turn it over to Dr. Sargent. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Emotional safety is the foundation for all learning and success. The pandemic and social injustice has caused widespread trauma, personal, vicarious, collective, and historical, heightening the need for trauma-informed SEL to care for ourselves, our students, and their families. 
Because our communities have experienced trauma to various degrees, we must first address Maslow before focusing on Bloom. Leaders and their teams can support teacher and student well-being by focusing on BCPS's three SEL competencies of awareness, relationships, and decision-making. This can be done by creating predictable routines for students, prioritizing connections and building strong supportive relationships and offering opportunities to experience and share the processing of emotions. As we prepare for hybrid learning, the Department of Social Emotional Support developed the SEL reentry plan, connecting as a collective community. Next slide, please. And next slide, sorry, I plowed right through those. There we go, thank you. The actions outlined in the plan are not an exhaustive list of activities, but rather considerations as school leaders and staff seek to build collective communities inclusive of the social, emotional, and physical well being of all staff and students. Next slide. Thank you. Staying home is incredibly important this year when individuals are sick. For 80% or more of people, COVID is a mild illness. It often feels like a cold. People also report lots of fatigue, body aches, and sometimes upset stomach. We know all about the loss of taste and smell, but that's not often the first symptom. It's the cold, the feeling that you're getting ill. We want all staff and students to stay home this year if they're not feeling well. Contact tracing is a process we use to make sure that anyone who has high risk close contact is notified and sent home. Nurses will be monitoring and enforcing quarantine. That's what you do if you've been exposed. And isolation, that's what you do if you have COVID. Before I end this slide, I wanna emphasize the following mitigation commandments. The first and greatest is to wear your mask. And the second is similar, stay six feet apart. If you follow these, you will be significantly safer. So again, the mitigation efforts are to prevent, interrupt, and separate. Next slide, please. An isolation room is being located at each school for students and staff that present communicable symptoms and that will need to be evaluated and are aware, awaiting parent pickup. We have partnered with facilities to provide the isolation room that is required by the CDC and MSDE guidance. Next slide, please. Emergency pre preparation and response. So prior to the start of this school year, administrators and their teams developed site-based emergency plans. These plans will be continued to be used and adapted for our hybrid learning. Mandated drills will be required for each in-person cohort so all students have opportunities to practice safety drills. The reporting of bullying, harassment, and intimidation will continue as this remains a key component of student safety. Next slide. The safety of students and staff continues to be our top priority. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Visitors to our schools and offices are restricted. School and office staff will attempt to handle business with visitors remotely whenever possible. If business cannot be handled remotely, the visit visitor should schedule an appointment. If granted an appointment, visitors should adhere to specific guidelines that include rescheduling visits if they have symptoms of COVID, uh, limiting people in their party to only those necessary for the visit, bringing photo identification, wearing a face covering, maintaining six feet of distance, 
registering in the office and leaving the building as soon as the meeting is over. Next slide, please. As we transition to hybrid learning, it's important to review school wide and classroom norms and expectations that promote safe and supportive hybrid learning environments. Our student handbook and the resource guide to developing a school wide positive behavior plan are two of the resources available to staff in preparation for the transition to in person learning. At this time, I'd like to introduce and welcome Dr. Jones uh, to introduce the next slide. Dr. Jones. Dr. Oh, it's going to be me, Dr. Roberts. Oh, I apologize. Thank for you, that. Dr. Roberts. <laughs> no problem. Good evening, everybody. So the second part of the reentry plan pertains to system and school operations. At this time, schools are working through the critical operation processes and systems, as well as structures that will support student return. And we certainly thank them for their continued efforts. Next slide, please. One critical part of operations is the development of cohorts, specifically cohorts A and B. Principals receive student cohorts by address, and at this time they are examining those cohorts and making any necessary adjustments in the event that an address assigned cohort prevents mitigation strategies. In some instances, classes may need to be changed, but this will be an option of last resort. Once all cohort cohorts are finalized at the school level, transportation will finalize bus routes. All families, regardless of the date of reentry for a student, will receive cohort information for their students from their child's school. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jones, who will continue with hybrid instruction. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, and good evening. We recognize that families may have originally selected a full virtual model and now may want to opt into the hybrid model. model. Similarly, we have families who did not complete the questionnaire and have been assigned to a virtual pathway and want to opt into hybrid instruction. We have created a process that allows families to opt into hybrid learning through the spring. A request for hybrid learning form and link have been placed on the school's web pages and a message has been shared with families by each school principal. Actually, the link is on the school's web page, which takes them to a form. The form provides the calendar windows to complete, as you can see, um, a depiction of that on the slide, and also has the corresponding starting week for students to engage in hybrid in-person learning. Additionally, prior to a student's return to school, the family will receive cohort assignments and any applicable transportation information. Next slide, Dr. Scriven. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Sure. So Mills will continue to be offered at no cost to all students through June of 2021. Students with special dietary needs will continue to be accommodated. And there is no time restriction uh, between breakfast and lunch meals. Uh, prior to the pandemic in a normal school setting, when BCPS served breakfast and lunch to students, uh, lunch could not be served before 10 o'clock. Uh, that restriction is waived under the current guidelines. Uh, BCPS will not be restricted on service times, which will allow for COVID-19 health and safety measures to be implemented. Cafeteria staff are not working, are, are going to work directly with school administration. So we are going to be a support uh, to school administrators in terms of choice option. Uh, within both options, as you can see, there's an option one and two. Uh, school administrators will have full autonomy in the implementation of breakfast and lunch schedules and delivery in accordance with the size of their school and in compliance with BCPS COVID-19 mitigation strategies. Such mitigation strategies include students wearing masks when not eating and staying six feet apart. All school-based food service personnel will adhere to all health and safety requirements. They will follow multiple mitigation strategies, including completing the COVID mitigation checklist provided by BCPS, follow social distancing signage, 
and mask reminder signs for staff and food services staff will be required to sign the COVID-19 employee expectations and acknowledgement form. Curbside uh, meal service times at both the high and middle school sites will be between 11 o'clock a.m. and 1 o'clock p.m. when we return uh, to a hybrid model or when we implement the hybrid model. In terms of sanitization, all schools have been provided with standalone or wall mounted hand sanitizer stations that will be continuously refilled by the building operations staff as needed. Uh, the disinfectants used by BCPS staff are EPA approved and are recommended by the CDC. Uh, schools requesting spray bottles with cleaning solution are being provided provided for classroom use for in between wipe downs when necessary. Cleaning and disinfecting will be performed throughout the day on high touch surfaces and classrooms will be clean and disaffected when they are vacant. Arrival and dismissal procedures, uh, face coverings are required for all uh, persons in BCPS property. Parents guardians must remain in their vehicles on BCPS property. Parents will not be permitted to enter the school building. Schools will establish procedures for arrival in terms of building entry and dismissal with exiting the building. Late arrivals and early dismissals for walkers, bus riders and car riders. Certain doors will be used to enter and exit and stairwells will be assigned for use in terms of flow of students uh, in stairways and in hallways. And at this time, I'd like to yield the floor to Dr. McComas. Yes, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Scrivens. Um, part three, the heart of our reopening plan, of course, is our core mission, which is instruction. And so I'm going to take a few moments here to just walk you through uh, how that is continuing to uh, evolve so that you can have a sense of what it will be like in a in hybrid instruction. Next slide, please. Um, on this slide, what you see is something that you're very familiar with. We've been sharing uh, this overarching model of hybrid for uh, many months now. Students, as previously mentioned, are of course organized um, into A or B cohorts if they choose to have hybrid in-person instruction for part of the week. And of course, families who are choosing to remain virtual are grouped in cohort C. And that was discussed earlier by my colleagues, uh, the community superintendents. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. What you have here is um, how this looks for our youngest learners, our preschool students and our pre-kindergarten students who have half day programs. Uh, these students in these programs typically attend a half day program uh, five days a week in a normal uh, school year. Um, and so here you can see how our A cohorts and our B cohorts are broken up into um, morning and afternoon sessions so that it approximates um, as best we can at this point their typical program. Um, for their cohorting and cohort C students, of course, remain virtual. If I could go to the next slide. And for our next group of students, our uh, kindergarten through second grade students, um, for the first two weeks, um, they will have an early dismissal um, so that our teachers are able to help acclimate students to hybrid and um, pay a, a adequate attention given the developmental age uh, for our younger learners. Um, in those early dismissal hours. And if you look to the left of the screen, what you'll see is what this looks like for from the student point of view, right? So if you're a student in the in the classroom during the day, uh, you'll see there anywhere you see uh, the little icon of a camera, that's where the teacher is integrating the students in person as well as the students that are on virtual. And so this is what we refer to as uh, concurrent experience for the virtual and in-person students. And you can see how that unfolds and integrates and that there's time that that is to get there together and that there's time that they're separate. The virtual students are doing independent learning while the in-person students are doing uh, direct work with the teacher in the classroom. Next slide, please. As we move into phase three, uh, we have uh, special education students in grades three to 12 whose primary um, 
uh, placement is outside of the general education setting in these specific programs. Additionally, at this point, we will fold in um, some of our CTE students and select programs who need access to hands-on uh, equipment and training as part of the standards and credentialing process for their particular programs. Um, it is important to note that at phase three, um, this triggers serve many logistics around transportation and processes. And so at that point, our early learners will um, in grades K to two will go to a full day program so that our transportation process can run smoothly. Um, all of these processes were developed in um, extensive collaboration over uh, many weeks uh, with many stakeholders. So if we could go into the next slide, please. What we have here is really the spectrum or continuum of what hybrid instruction can look like. And it's important for all of our stakeholders to understand that instruction, rather in a traditional setting, in a virtual setting, or even in our, our new found territory of hybrid instruction, takes many forms and ebbs and flows in, in the methodologies that are used based on the content standards uh, that are being taught and the developmental age of the students. And so it's important to understand uh, that instruction will still take um, a variety of forms uh, based on what is being taught. This is part of um, the slide you see here is part of the professional development that we've been providing for our school administration teams. And then we'll pick up tomorrow um, is a professional development opportunity for our teachers around hybrid instruction. And this is just one uh, small framework to help set that professional learning. Next slide, please. What you have here also is um, a very uh, overview uh, lesson um, planning guide uh, to help our teachers think through how do I develop my lessons in a concurrent manner so that I have students in person with me and I will at different points throughout the day uh, be serving our students who are virtual because we want to make sure that we sustain the quality uh, for those students who are having a virtual day. Next slide, please. Um, and lastly, um, not quite lastly here, but this last thing for instruction, uh, what you have here is how that concurrent model can look like at the secondary level in different um, schedules. So if you look to the left, you'll see just a sample of um, an AB a day period, just one class period, how it could be broken up uh, to support concurrent instruction. And if you look to the right, you'll see um, a sample of a schedule where students um, aren't in an extended period, but they may have uh, seven periods ultimately that they rotate through. And again, you can see how that concurrent instruction is integrated throughout the class period. Next slide, please. And then lastly, what I'd like to provide an update is around athletics. As everyone knows, our fall high school athletic um, competitive season begins February 13th. Um, hopefully there won't be any snow. Um, we are pleased to say that we've been able to arrange transportation to help support students getting to and from practices at least up until March 1st when our transportation team begins to pick up all the requirements around um, transporting students for hybrid instruction given the um, social distancing requirements on buses as well. We're also pleased to announce that our allied sports program for our special education students um, at the high school level will um, also be offered for both the fall and the spring semester as is typically done each year as well. Um, and that really concludes my portion of this presentation. I believe I'm handing it off to my colleague, Ms. Lowry. Good evening. You could advance to the next slide, thank you. The Office of Benefits, Leaves and Retirement manages employee leave requests related to the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and Family and Medical Leave Act. The Families First Coronavirus Response Act provides qualifying employees with paid sick leave and expanded family and medical leave for specified reasons related to COVID-19. These provisions have been extended through the end of March 2021. The Office of Employee Absence and Risk Management works with our employees that have a medical related issue requiring them to take 10 or more consecutive accrued personal illness dates. Next slide, please. Any employee who has a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act may seek workplace accommodations 
and should contact the BCPS Office of Equal Employment Opportunity directly or supervisors may also refer an employee if the employee indicates a medical issue or presents a doctor's note with restrictions. Accommodations for remote work can be considered in light of Baltimore County Public Schools current status, the nature of the employee's work, the need for in-person work, and whether the employee can be reasonably accommodated. Given the various positions at Baltimore County Public Schools, such requests will be made on a case-by-case -case basis and will need to balance the employee's health and needs along with the needs of the workplace. Even if an accommodation request is not granted, Baltimore County Public Schools will work with the employee to discuss alternatives to the requested accommodations. At this time, I will pass it to Dr. Williams. So uh, schools are in the process as we wrap up this presentation. Schools are in the process of developing school specific communication for their families. Similar to when we return to school in August or September, families can expect back to school communication. This communication will be shared through multiple mediums, electronic mailings, etc. Additional supports have been provided to schools regard regarding communication. These include screening checklists and magnets and signage for schools. We will continue to work with our principals regarding their needs to provide support for their communication to their communities. Next slide. So in preparation for March 1st, 2021 return of students and based on the extended questionnaire data, we anticipate uh, about 144 uh, students, uh, about 38% um, from a possible 372 students returning for phase one. Uh, for phase two, we anticipate about 13,058 from a possible 26,672 students returning for phase two. Uh, the total number of students expected to return for to school for phase one and two will be uh, a little bit more than 13,202. So schools will continue to finalize their respective cohorts and will share that information with parents prior to students returning to schools. So we thank you for your time and attention and I'll turn it back over to Madam Chairwoman Scott. Thank you all so much for that. And um, I believe we have uh, several questions. So we'll start first with Mr. McMillian. Uh, thank you, Ms. Scott. I have a motion I'd like to make. I move Baltimore County Public Schools waives the academic requirement in parentheses, C average, semicolon, not more than one E, parentheses, for high school athletic participation for the upcoming fall slash spring sporting season beginning on February 13th. Thank you. Second, Ms. Causey. Okay. So a motion has been um, seconded. Um, Mr. McMillian, would you um, care to speak to your motion? Uh, just a little history. Last summer sometime or late last spring, uh, the eligibility was waived for fall participation. So normally fall participation is based on fourth quarter grades. So those grades were waived so everybody could participate in the fall. I'm extending this, or your, my motion would extend this through this season that starts on February 13th. And I really think it's an equity issue. If you look at all across the county, a lot of different kids have issues with with uh, internet and hotspots and that kind of thing. This has given everyone the opportunity to play. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, and it looks like, uh, Mr. Mahomes, did you have a question on Mr. McMillian's motion? Yeah, question okay. slash comment. Um, although I, uh, this is a, this is a tough one because I, I see where Mr. McMillian's going uh, with equity and I understand that COVID has obviously, um, caused a lot of students to not perform as well. I just want to hear from Dr. Williams, um, because I'm concerned if we allow students, um, to take sports, which sports is a, a very, uh, daunting, uh, 
endeavor itself and it's going to take a lot of time out of their uh, school lives for so not less time for homework less time to study for um quizzes and stuff and if we're going into the third and fourth quarter and they're already behind i mean is it prudent to add sports to their schedule shouldn't we be focusing on uh, making sure they're past the school year especially our uh, high schoolers where they actually need to graduate they need to pass classes to graduate so i guess dr williams what i want to hear is for those students who are behind um especially seniors what are they doing like what are teachers doing right now in order to help them graduate that's my first question are there like specialized so, like programs or something so madam scott uh, madam chairwoman scott may i respond to that i i would like to yep. understand the desire and I understand the conditions that we're in. I too have similar questions and concerns. I will then like to ask either Dr. McComas or Michael Sire, coordinator of athletics, to kind of weigh in um, to this motion at this time. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I am going to invite um, Mr. Sai to, to join the conversation. And actually, I'm going to hand it over um, to him just because I want to make sure that we're making um, quick use of airtime tonight. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. So while I understand Mr. McMillian's um, concern regarding our eligibility requirement, I wanted to just chime in just a little bit from the athletic um, officer athletic standpoint. Um, I, I'd like to quickly provide you with a historical perspective of athletic ability, a athletic eligibility. Like since athletics was instituted in BCPS, there's always been an athletic eligibility uh, policy. It started with no more than one failing grade. And in 2012, the MPSSAA had asked each local school system um, to look into increasing the eligibility requirements to assist student athletes with the recent demands of college entry and NCAA scholarships. Hence is how we ended up with our 2.0 slash no more than one failing grade. Mr. McMillian is correct. We did provide a waiver this past spring as it relates to um, athletics, primarily because when COVID hit, the grading policy changed. And it, and it went totally against everything that our athletic eligibility policy, most of it was pass fail that moved into, which impacted our first quarter moving into next year. So that was the reason why it was changed. Outside of that reason, since the inception of the athletic eligibility policy in Baltimore County, it has stood the test of time. Um, and we know um, athletically, we've had many of our students who have had um, things that have impacted their lives, um, things that have um, caused them to, to miss school, and we've always stood behind our policy, um, and kids have met that policy. And we uh, realized that at this particular point in time, we're just trying to hold our kids accountable. Athletics has always been a privilege um, to wear that uniform and represent your school and to earn that place on the team through your academics first and through your play second. And by removing that um, or, get, or providing the waiver, I strongly believe that um, we're not holding our kids accountable for what they're doing in the classroom uh, right now. And again, we have several of our student athletes that are doing what they need to do in the classroom and have made the ac ac academic standards that we put forth. And, and, and I'm, I'm concerned about um, the statement that we're making by saying to those kids that have, have met the challenges of this virtual and again i do understand that this virtual has been difficult for many of our student athletes or for our students in general but they have stepped up to the plate and done what they needed to do to make sure that they are academically eligible for our sports seasons we provided that waiver in the um, last spring for the fall we have engaged our kids virtually to help make sure our coaches have stayed in contact with them and provided them the opportunities not just for ac athletic support but for academic support as well so with that being said, I understand there may be some inequities, but the accountability piece um, is, is truly important for us. And then regarding the precedent it sets moving forward, I mean, at this point, if we do this, I mean, I think we would be setting the precedent that it could be challenged every single time there's something that's going on. And again, I understand this is a pandemic, but again, we've had kids with a lot of other hard life um, changing events 
that that we've always said that you have to meet the requirement or you can't participate. And the, my last point that I'd like to put forward, uh, a lot of our principals, both at the high school and middle school, and I know Rod has talked about a little bit about the impact of the high school, but they are hand in hand. The same athletic eligibility policy at the high school is the exact same one at the middle school. And I know that our principals would like to probably have some input on this as many of them are, are against um, waiving the hey. athletic eligibility policy. So with that, yeah. I'll yield back. Oh, yes. Thank you. And could yeah. um, members please mute their um Well, I'm just listening. Or, OK, if we can make them. sure who, somebody's phone is unmuted or I somebody's. Hello. Could we make sure everybody mutes, please? Thank you. <laughs> OK, um, so it looks like we had a question. I, I, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, uh, Mr. Kuhn, you wanted to. I, I still have the floor, sorry. Oh, I apologize, Mr. Mahoney. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to go back. And Mr. Sai definitely uh, answered my question and some of the other comments I had. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, I guess another part of my question is in terms of um, the. I'm trying to understand uh, the academic uh, eligibility requirements. So is it saying you can't fail a quarter or, or is it like you can't? fail multiple quarters. So I, I guess what I'm saying is if they if a student perform poorly in like the first and second quarter, can they still redeem themselves in third and still participate in the last quarter like the of these spring sports? Yes, sir. So that's how it's all academic eligibility works off your quarter grades. Yeah. So again, um, for those that did not meet the standard um, a few weeks ago or a week ago as it relates to the second quarter grades, uh, they can redeem themselves and go out for the spring teams uh, with their third quarter grades. And then the fourth quarter grades impact the following, the start of the fall season in 21. Yeah, well, yeah, no, thank you. And I'm just going to conclude by saying that, although um, I understand like Mr. Sai and Dr. Williams and other members have mentioned um, some of the challenges students have faced. Um, academics is an incentive. It's a positive incentive that we give to our students. Um, I mean, not academics, uh, athletics, uh, and that requires them to perform well with their academics. And I just I don't think it's equitable for us to suspend their academics and their requirements just for athletics. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. Uh, next, we have Mr. Kuhn. Oh, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I think this question may have been slightly answered, but I'd, I'd like to get clarification. So just so I understand where. What is. What are we allowing at this point if we pass this motion um, academic wise? Um, uh, because is it a C and one E or could could someone clarify that like a 2.0 with only one E or something like that? I'm, I want to make sure I'm crystal clear on this. So it is my understanding, Mr. Kuhn, that Mr. McMillian is asking that we drop all academic um, requirements to participate in sports. Therefore, anybody could um, participate regardless of their grades uh, in our interscholastic athletics. That's what I believe. Mr. McMillian, is that is that accurate? Well, my motion drops the academic requirement C average or not more than one A, but I like to point out the prerequisites already been established back in the spring. Thank you. All right, thank you for the clarification. OK, and uh, it looks like next we have Dr. Hager. Um, yes, I am. Um, I, I want to first thank Mr. Sai for your perspective that you shared with us and also all of your hard work in getting this together by February 13th. I know it was a huge ask and we really appreciate all that you did to, to get this ready for the students. Um, and I guess my I I'm inclined to support uh, the motion in part because I don't know that these students had that hope in mind that this was going to happen for them. And it has moved really quickly and I just. Um, they, they just didn't know that it was going to be in place by February 13th, and so they you know, even if they scrambled to try to get their grades up at the very end and weren't able to do that and now they're dedicated and back on board. Um, I just feel like it, it, to take that away from them, given all the reasons that Mr. McMillian mentioned 
does feel um, a little tough. And so I, um, I, I'm, I think I'm with uh, with Josh and that I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with it, but at the same time, it, it does feel like this is such an exceptional circumstance and things are moving really quickly right now that I would be inclined to support it. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Next, we have Ms. Quasi. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to quickly say that um, I greatly appreciate uh, the work of Mr. Sai and his whole department and, um, you know, respect his opinion to the utmost. Um, and, you know, he knows that I'm uh, dedicated to academic achievement for all of our students. I just think that this has been such a uh, drastic circumstances where these students didn't know if this was going to happen. They didn't have hope. Um, and I think that we need to provide them with the hope we can get back to normal in a new way, a different way, socially distanced, COVID mitigation, uh, providing safe avenues, uh, but it is critical that we allow our children to uh, be engaged and uh, maybe there's a middle ground uh, with waiving them to reducing them, uh, but then also to put in front of the students that third and fourth quarter are very important for the fall when we're hoping to really be normal. So I, I just feel it's important to do this so that more students can be involved. Uh, and we know, we know from typical years uh, that student athletes typically do well in school and uh, their coaches are part of that, encouraging them to excel in all that they do. Thank you, Ms. Colsey. Did we have any additional questions from members um, related to the motion? Okay, uh, Mr. Mahomes, you said you had a follow-up question. No, just the reply, if that's okay. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, and it was just like uh, the previous two board members that have spoken about um, just people, uh, students not having hope and with everything going on with COVID. And I just wanted to provide another perspective and I'm and I just, think that um, if those students who didn't have hope and uh, now we're going to allow them to take athletics, although that they've been struggling with their classes virtually and now we're slowly opening up schools, um, does that really seem like a prudent idea? Because if a we're now into second quarter and if a student has struggled uh, this year, I, I just don't really see the idea in how we're helping them um, if they're seniors and it's their last season and I um, and I feel for them um, it's been a hard year but uh, athletes are always taught um, to take what you learn from the field and what you've learned through your season and use that throughout your school year so that means keeping up with your academics and this idea that um, you should only um, uh, excel in school just to play a sport, I, I think it's a ridiculous idea. Students should always perform. Athletics provide an incentive, and if we continue with that, it's just it's just terrible, and that's not the mindset we should be giving to our students. Thank you. Ms. Scott, Ms. Scott Ms. Oh, okay. sorry. Mm -hmm. Is that Mr. Sign? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was please. just going to make one other comment because I, I, I hear everyone's um, concerns regarding this matter and, and, and appreciate uh, the input, but I would just like to make one point. So when we were scheduled to return um, in when we were going to do in person uh, conditioning and that got canceled because the COVID numbers went up. And then when we were about to go back for our winter season, which ultimately got canceled altogether, there was academic eligibility requirements in place at that time. So with that being said, you know, those kids that were going to go out for basketball season, which ultimately did not have happen, Many of those kids were told that they were not going to be able to play because they didn't meet the academic standard, and that was during this school year. But now we're going to get to the middle of the road and then switch up. Again, I just think it's not fair because many of those kids didn't have hope either because they were told that they didn't make the academic, they didn't reach the academic standards. So again, we're changing the policy mid-road instead, and this wasn't done before, you know, the start of our, um, what would have been winter season. That was it. Thank you for that, Mr. Sai. Um, it looks like we have a question or a comment from Mrs. Pastor. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I, I really appreciate Mr. Uh, McMillian's sentiment. 
um, in terms of what has been lost and giving children hope. But I also think that there's nothing worse than uh, taking away uh, the things that they needed to do to play and then next year um, giving them the idea that all sorts of rules will change for them next year because and they won't and then they can't play. Um, this is a time to help our young people get back on a level playing field so that they understand um, we're still in this world and finding other ways to support them socially and emotionally, but we need to give them that stability and putting on something that has never been par for the course for them and then possibly having to take it away next year makes me worry about what we do to them socially and emotionally. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Pastor. And it looks like there is a clarifying question from Dr. Hager. Um, yes, thank you. Mr. Sai, if, if we were to change our eligibility criteria in Baltimore County, does that affect our ability to play in any sorts of um, larger statewide competition or anything like that? Um, I don't believe so. Uh, I would check with the state before we would move forward uh, on that. I mean, the state clearly says that we're supposed to have an ath athletic academic eligibility policy in place, uh, each school system. So again, I would need to, to check on that. Again, that would only affect those sports that are in the spring as I don't believe there will be a state tournament for this winter, this uh, upcoming fall season. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And, um, uh, Ms. McComas, Dr. McComas, you had a, a comment you wanted? To yes. Yes, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I just offer for uh, the board's consideration to recognize the intent around students not being eligible is so that they are, it is recognized recognize that they need additional supports and that we allocate the time to support them to become eligible, right? So the point of, of, of students not being eligible is not because we don't want them to play. It is for us basically to say, hey, heads up, we really need to focus and support our students so that we can get them to be eligible because we do want all of our students to be able to participate, um, but we also want to prioritize our academics um, and, you know, I certainly just offer that for everyone to consider in light of we have been um, engaged in uh, virtual learning for a full semester where we have been teaching the standards and we have been uh, working with students um, and we will continue to work with students as we move from virtual into a hybrid model. So I just I just offer that for everyone's consideration because um, I too want our students to thrive on the field and I most importantly, want them to thrive in the classroom as well. So I, I ask us not to lose um, sight of that academic uh, need as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. McComas. Um, Ms. Rowe? Yeah, so I just wanted to throw out a perspective on this that I might actually be the only person on this board who has. Sometimes when you go through serious trauma and you're a kid, and that trauma is compounded by life experiences and lack of support and a, a totally chaotic thing, which this pandemic has been for kids. If the thing that you grab onto is sports and that thing is gonna help you pick yourself up, that will lead to better academics. And I really think that for the sake of our own humanity, just let these kids play. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, I just wanted to speak as well um, on this and um, I wanted to know what sort of precedence this was setting because if we had, um, if, if Mr. McMillian's motion goes through and it is waived and someone plays, then next year, then the policy would go back in place and that means um, I just wanted to understand the way it would work. Um, Mr. McMillian, how long, I guess, did you have a time limit on it? Um, because it, it sounds like it would be something that would happen now for, um, I guess, the remainder of the year. And then after that, then the academic policy would go back into place. And so then what would happen to those children who were allowed to play the year prior? 
it waives the requirement for the fall and spring sporting set seasons that start on February 13th. So next fall, everything would go back the way it was. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, I guess I was just wondering what impact that would have on on a child. Um, and then also I'm thinking of the other side of children who have kept their grades up, who do have academic excellence and play, what message is that sending to them? So, because I know, you know, I, I, I kind of, I, I really understand both sides. So, but I, I am trying to um, think about um, and, you know, feel free, Mr. Sai or anyone else to comment on that. If, if I'm a child and I'm doing well and um, excelling and, um, and then it's being waived, then what happens to my incentive to want to keep doing well and um, so that I can maintain um, my position on, on the team? So it was more of just a comment. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I understand what you're saying. I don't know necessarily how to respond to it. Um, I think that that's internal for these kids to, to continue to want to excel, which I believe they would. Um, most of the student athletes in Baltimore County do an outstanding job of, of meeting the requirements. And again, I, I want to be clear. I, my heart goes out to every single one of the, our student athletes and every one of our kids in general that have been impacted by this pandemic. But the reality of it is, is that we, our job, and again, it's like a double-edged sword because again, I'm, I'm pushing for this, but then my heart goes out to the kids because I know that some of these kids, especially, um, are, are not going to have those opportunities because they didn't get to play end of last year and, and, and some didn't get to play earlier this year. But the reality of it is our whole program is based on participation. So we want kids to participate, but at what cost? We, we, we always talk about athletics as being education based. The field is an extension of the classroom. So the reality of it is we're putting the classroom to the side and just saying it's all about sports. And while I understand, I believe it was Ms. Rowe, I, I believe, who was talking about Ms. Hen, I'm not certain. Um, and I do apologize about the hope. The hope starts in the classroom and extends to the field. I want to, and I think that my athletic directors and coaches are, across the board, we all want to make sure our kids succeed both in the classroom and on the field. And that's what we've always been about, and that's what I'm pushing right now. Thank you for um, answering that, Mr. Sai. And it looks like, oh, Mr. Offman, we've not heard from Mr. Offman. Mr. Offman? I'd like to move the question. Second. Okay, so the question, so it's been moved and seconded. Um, Ms. Um, Gover, could we, um, I guess, take a vote on moving the question and then voting on the motion? Thank you. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causing? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So the question has been moved. So now um, we will vote or process, we'll vote on um, Mr. McMillian's motion. And, uh, yep. Ms. Rowe? I'm sorry, what was it? Uh, yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is seven. Sorry. Okay, so um, Mr. Um, McMillian's motion passes. 
And um, I guess when um, Mr. Sai, you had said, or I believe Dr. Hager raised the question, but you all said you would check with the state to see how that would impact the ability to play. Um, it was something that you said, I guess, um, um, in various games or things like that, if, or if, if waiving it, what impact that would have? When would um, we hear something about that? Uh, I will be able to look at that to that sometime tomorrow and hopefully have an answer tomorrow. Um, but I would say no later than the end of the week. That would be great. OK, and then um, would that be something, I guess, that, that Dr. Williams, that you would email to us so that we could um, make sure we had appropriate clarification? Yes. Wonderful. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so we did have some additional questions on the presentation itself. And, Madam Chair, um, I have a motion, please. Yep, that's what I'm coming up Thanks. on next. I had you next. I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> uh, right. I move to suspend the two minute rule for questions on the reopening plan. Second, Second Ms. Causey. <laughs> Could you speak to your motion, please? You're muted. Uh, yes, as soon as I unmute, sorry. This is the last time the board meets before the first group of 10 month staff return to the classroom on February 22nd. I believe as a board, we owe it to our staff, our students, and our parents to take the time needed tonight to address any outstanding issues and questions that they may have and that we have, and two minutes may not allow that to happen. Okay, any other discussion, questions? Madam Chair, I call the question. Second. The question has Wait. been... I thought you said if we wanted to talk, we put the names in the discussion uh, in the comments. We do. And I was calling on Josh um, before the question was called. So, um, Mr. Mercedes, would it be appropriate just for Josh to ask this question? Because I was calling on Joshua before Ms. Hen called the question. If you were calling on Josh before the question got called, then Yes, proceed with Mr. Mahamsa. Okay. Okay, Mr. Mahamsa. Yeah, um, I understand what Ms. Max says about like tonight, uh, and I think I would agree if if the the motion only pertains to tonight's meeting, but how it's worded, um, I think I how I am reading it. It says for all reopening um, agenda items that we have. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Mack. Thank you. I'd be happy to offer that clarification, Mr. Mahomsa. I'm talking specifically about tonight because our first group of teachers and staff are returning on the 22nd and there's a lot of outstanding questions. So thank you for asking that clarifying question. Yeah, just for um, procedural. Uh, no, I understand. Things. Can we uh, add for just tonight's meeting? Yes, I move to suspend the two minute rule for questions on tonight's reopening plan. Who was it that gave the second? I believe Ro. it was Miss Causey. Miss, no, I think it was Ro. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you for restating that, Miss Mack. Okay. And then, um, um, oh, Miss Causey, you have a question? Rule suspension is not debatable. I'm sorry. I think Miss Mack called the vote. Yes, I'm, I am I put in for the question for after this. For after Ms. Hens call is processed. Okay. Sorry. All right. So let's OK. Sorry, just got a little confused there. So basically, um, Ms. Hen called the question and it was seconded. So then now um, we need to vote on the question being called and debate on Ms. Max motion. Is that correct, Madam Mr. Mercedes? Yes. Madam Chair, a motion to suspend rule yes. is not a debatable motion. Can you repeat that, Ms. Rowe? I can't hear you. Yeah, we can't hear, really hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. A motion to suspend rules is not a debatable motion. Okay, so then we need to vote on it? Well, yeah, we don't need a motion to call the question because you can't debate it in the first place. Yeah, so no, Ms. Hen called the question. So then, then don't we take a vote on the end of debate? Yes. No, because it's not a debatable motion to begin with. 
Mr. Mercedes, please guide us how we should go forward. Oh. Yeah, I thought that we called the question to take a vote, but Mr. Mercedes, if you could guide us, it seems to be some um, differings of opinion. Uh, a motion to suspend the rules is not debatable. So it can go, it's going to have the same effect as calling the question uh, because they both require a two thirds majority. Okay, so then we need to vote on Ms. Mack's motion. Yes. Okay. Okay, were there additional questions or anything? No? Okay. Okay, so Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is nine. Okay, so then the two minute time limit is suspended for the um, reopening um, discussion. Okay, so then going down the, sorry, go ahead. Oh, Ms. Scott, I, I apologize for jumping in, but I just was wondering if, if you thought it would uh, logistically be sound to still do two minutes, but just keep going around so that one person doesn't ask, you know, 25 minutes worth of questions so that we can that kind of was, continue to go around. That wasn't the motion. It was okay, to, sorry. That's fine then. That, I, I, it was just a realistic idea. No worries. Everybody so. talk for as long as, <laughs> okay. just, you know, it, I just would fair. ask that we all be respectful of each other and our time and um, uh, make sure that everybody has an appropriate time to speak. So um, next was um, Ms. Gauzy. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, so my first question is, on the January 19th meeting when we uh, were discussing the reopening, there was a six page document attached to board docs in which it said that teachers would report uh, to their classrooms, school-based staff return to school one week prior to student return. I wanted to ask Dr. Williams uh, or staff, what is the rationale for our teachers having to report uh, so much sooner, two weeks, three weeks, and uh, four weeks in some cases. So Ms. Causey, in the negotiated agreement, there was time that was very clear for staff to return prior to students. And we built in time for staff to set up classrooms, again, a part of the negotiated agreement. When you say uh, negotiated agreement, is that the memo mem memorandum of understanding? Ms. Lowry, would you would you answer that, please? Yes, there was language in both, Ms. Causey. There's language in the master agreement that talks about the amount of time that is required to give teachers to prep to set up their classroom. And then um, there was within the um, MOUs, there was uh, language um, that would represent the amount of time as far as notice that teachers should be given prior to reporting um, and having time in their classroom again to set up um, to prep for the students to come in. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. So there was a memo of understanding recently uh, negotiated with the TABCO and ESPBC and the other bargaining agreement, bargaining units? Yes, so teachers um, are to report, um, have one week notice, and the administrators um, in the, the um, previous MOU, it had stated um, two weeks. So we were working through um, that language, um, and, it, and there were differences as far as You'll note um, principals um, 
were coming in at on a different schedule and administrators are coming in on a different schedule from teachers. So I don't believe the board has seen the most recent MOU. Can that be attached to board docs, please? And can someone state clearly what the current agreement is? For teachers? Teachers and, and other staff, if it's different than the January 19th timeline for reentry. So it 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 is the the timeline the week before. Um, hold on one moment and let me see if I can pull up that schedule real quick. Certainly, thank you. If one of the CSs. Um, so right. So the in the plan, Miss Lowry and Miss Causey. So our teachers, our elementary teachers for phase one and two report February twenty second. Um, which would be the week prior to phase one and two being implemented, um, which would be March 1st, and then phase three teachers. Um, so we move forward to March 8th, that I'm looking at it too. I'm not looking at this is just for my for my memory of looking at March 8th would be when um, our next round of teachers would report. Um, so that would be through our secondary, but we can confirm that as well. That is correct, Dr. Roberts. James. So again, how many weeks prior is it for the teachers? So our phase three students report on March 15th, so that'd be one week prior. And February 22nd is one week uh, prior to March 1st, Ms. Causey. Okay, great. So that's an update from the document that went out last Monday. Is that a question, Ms. Causey? I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am, that's a question. Okay. Uh, um, what, just to clarify, what document are you referring to so Dr. Roberts and I can provide clarity? Dr. Williams sent out a document to the board at 445 last Monday, and then we received thousands of emails so, Ms. Cause, if you're referring, if you're referring to update as a change, it's not a change. I don't know if in what context you're you're saying update. That was the information that was shared February 22nd. Elementary phase one and two, March 8th, phase three. Students return on March 15th. Okay, are you finished, Ms. Cause, or do you have well, more questions? Uh, I think it's helpful to have if there was a recently approved me memorandum of understanding, the board should have been provided that and it also those relevant documents should be attached to board docs. Uh, we received thousands of emails where teachers were saying, why do we have to come to the classroom two or three weeks prior to students being there? So I just wanted to clarify and where is it written now? that the teachers are only coming one week prior. Ms. Causey, the MOU is um, still in negotiations. We have a meeting this Wednesday, um, tomorrow morning, um, to try to clarify some of the, the last points. Um, Dr. Williams included all of the union leads in the decision making as far as when the teachers would report. And um, TABCO, had made the decision that their teachers should report back one week prior to their students reporting rather than all teachers reporting back at the same time. So um, as far as the schedule is concerned, it really does coincide when the students are returning to the building. We will provide the board with the, um, the completed MOU, the final, um, and I do anticipate that that will be wrapped up this week and we will be able to share that with you. Does that complete your questions, Ms. Causey? Uh, no, actually, I'd like to I'd like to nail this down. I'd like to make a motion that the board. Uh, 
have the MOU represent that the teachers come back no more than one week prior to students. Second, Mac. Okay. Ms. Scott, if I could speak to my motion. Yes, please do. So as I mentioned, we did receive uh, thousands of emails and uh, many teachers were saying they don't get, uh, <clears throat> I guess, two prep days and then they have meeting days before a whole school year. Um, <clears throat> additionally, uh, our teachers with school age children um, are left without uh, coverage for their students um, if their students are not in the phase uh, where the teacher has to report. So I think when we're asking our teachers and staff and administrators to make this pivot, which is um, for the best interest of our children, um, that we make it as feasible and uh, as possible for them and not make it additional hardship. Okay, could you put that in um, the chat box so that, and if you could restate your motion, because I'm, it's, I, I think a lot of us aren't really clear what it is. So if you could restate it and then also write it in the chat so that we can clear. Yes, that the board approves in the memorandum of understanding that teachers and support staff report back no sooner than one week prior to their students. Okay. Um, my only question with this is, uh, I understand it was moved and seconded and you spoke to it. Um, is this going into operations? And I want to know the feasibility, Dr. Williams, of um, how that would happen. So thank you, um, Madam Chair. I, I will say, uh, I just want to reiterate what the team shared and we worked collaboratively with our union leads. Um, but for our teachers, our 12 month teachers, um, February 22nd is their day to return for those who are part of the uh, phase one and phase two. And then for phase three, for students to return on March 15th, our, our 10 month teachers, so that's looking at uh, middle and high, uh, if I have it right, would be returning on March 8th. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we worked with our partners to come up with a schedule. We presented the phase in approach to the board. So my notification was to alert everyone about our plan. So everyone had a date in which a return was announced. Um, and we worked, I think we worked well with our partners to come up with this schedule. I appreciate those comments, but I, I guess my concern is, is that if the memorandum of understanding is not yet approved, that the collaboration is not complete. And um, if the board members agree with me that we've received, you know, a lot of concern about this from our teachers, and I feel it's just helpful for everyone to, to clarify it. Well, again, the concerns, as Ms. Lowry said, there's, there's a session tomorrow to try to wrap up their concerns and provide some answers. Um, but we are providing a week in advance for our teachers to return. So if those students who are coming in on March 1st, those 10 month teachers are coming in February 22nd, a week prior. Just like those those students who are returning on the 15th will be coming back on March 8th. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Dr. Williamson, because I guess my question would be then is it sounds like uh, what you just said, Ms. Mo Ms. Causey's motion then is, is already happening uh, based on the, the, the returning times of the teachers that they're already coming back, unless I misunderstood something. Um, no, that is correct. That's correct. They are returning one week prior. Then, Ms. Causey, how does your motion then do anything different than what's already happening? How is it not redundant? That's what I'm not understanding. 
So it's a clarifying and confirming motion. But if they're already coming back a week prior, what is there to clarify and confirm? The, the memorandum of understanding has not yet been completed. And there are two documents that have said different things to the extent that we have received uh, thousands of emails from teachers. And mm -hmm. this just clarifies what it will end up being. And if you could clarify for me, what are those two different documents? You said it was something that I, I well, don't. There's the January 19th re-entry update timeline for re-entry and then there was the email that uh was sent out monday um <clears throat> with a re-entry plan that had some teachers coming back uh three to four weeks before their students so miss causey you, you must be referring to phase four and how we have separated phase four, where uh, we have, uh, based on input from our principals, which makes sense for our sixth graders and ninth graders to return on, on uh, March 22nd, and then the remaining of our students returning on April 6th. Yes, so the so the the motion is the board approves addition to memorandum memorandum of understanding that teachers and support staff report back no more than one week prior to students to return. So that would include the working week, not the holiday week. OK, all right, looks like um, Miss Mack would like to comment on your motion, Miss Calls or has a Clarifying yes, um, just uh, to clarify, I have had high school teachers tell me that they are due back on March 8th and their students are not due back until April 6th. So um, I can't reference any documents as readily as Miss Causey is, but I have had high school teachers actually reach out to me to say that they have to be back on the 8th of March and their students aren't back until the 6th. So if somebody could clarify why there could be some confusion around that, I would appreciate it. So Ms. Mack, the March 8th date for return for our secondary teachers, again, coincides with the one week advance to the March 15th return of phase three. Uh, phase three are our third graders through 12th graders outside general education and CTE students. As we get into the secondary schedules with middle school and high schools, when we work with um, that students within that phase, they very well are going to have schedules that require other teachers to be there outside of their specific special education and or career technology education teachers. So the reason we need to have all of our secondary teachers back is because though a student may have a particular course, a particular CTE course, they also have English and math and other courses that they would need which requires and necessitates all of the secondary teachers to be back. I'm sorry, um, Dr. Roberts. Mm -hmm. I, we are bringing kids back for their CTE, but during that period of time that they're coming back or um, kids that are in specialized programs, during that period of time that they're coming back, they're not going to ELA and math. Is that correct? They're not going to start going back to ELA and math until April 6th. When they return, they're coming back and they're returning back into a hybrid environment where they will be there for the full days. So the understanding is that they're not, not just coming back for that particular time. So they could come. So that's why we would need those kids back or the teachers back because our, especially our special education students may have classes outside of their special education courses that they would need their teachers there for. Uh, can I remind everybody to mute? All right, so um, if we could uh, vote on Ms. Causey's motion, please. Ms. Gover, could you do the roll call vote? Ms. Rao? Ms. Rao? Pass and come back. Pass and come back to me, please. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. 
Ms. Jones? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Mahamza? Abstain. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Hester? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Madam Scott? Yes. I'm sorry. Um, phase three, let me just re-emphasize. Phase three is outside of general ed, grades three to 12, and select CTE. And those students are scheduled to come back on March 15th. So that involves several teachers and scheduling for the secondary is going to be problematic because phase three is bringing back grades three to 12. So we're looking at middle and high. We're looking at select CTE outside of general ed. We're going to need the staff and we're going to need our principals to plan and, and, and do those schedules. So I'm a little concerned about um, changing the time frame in which staff members are reporting because it's the operation, it's the scheduling, it's, 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 I just have to raise that concern. Um, thank you, Dr. Williams, for, um, for, for saying that. Um, so we did take a vote, Ms. Um, Rowe, excuse me, Ms. Gover, um, what was the final count? The favor was seven. Favor seven, okay. Um, uh, there's a question from Ms. Jose. Is that um, in relation to the motion? Yes, Ms. Scott. Um, no. Just like Mr. Dr. Williams just explained. So, what does this motion now do? Because clearly, we've gone into operations now and, and moved things around without knowing, you know, the full impact of it. Which is why I voted no on this. Um, without understanding what the impacts are going to be, just really nearly making motions and passing them, and then the staff has to go. So can you please clarify on that, Dr. Williams? Because we don't run the school system. I got inundated by a lot of teachers as well, 2,000, 3,000 emails, personal phone calls, but I am processing that and I don't want to go into operation. So Dr. Williams, if, if what does this motion do? Now, how does that put you in a bind or? So I know when we looked at these phases and we looked at particularly uh, all of them actually and looking at how to build schedules, not only how to build schedules for our cohorts, but building schedules for our staff. Um, I just worry that looking at a different timeline for the question, it sounds like phase three, phases three, four, phases three and four to build those schedules and to have staff to come back a week before um, could be potentially problematic for our school principals. Um, again, we sat down and looked at how to best do this and to break up the groups and cohorts. Um, again, Phase three is outside of general ed as for grades three to 12 and select CTE. So there may not be just one single teacher. There's multiple teachers to try to build a schedule um, based on our cohorting. I just think it's, it's going to be the operational side in building these schedules that I think making this motion and approving it, it approving it will potentially cause us more delays in, in finalizing schedules. Because remember, we also have to finalize the transportation cohorting cohorts as well. And I just worry about what was just passed. Thank you um, for that. Next we have Dr. Hager. Um, yeah. I. I'm still I'm a bit confused. I, I was under the impression that the motion was um, 
ensuring that the teachers whose students weren't coming back until let's say April 6th, then would not need to come back until a week before, just like if it were August or, or the school year starting. And, and it sounded to me like that was what the uh, what TABCO was going to ask for tomorrow. And so it kind of just lined up bordering on redundant as we talked about earlier in the conversation. Um, but now I'm hearing that this is actually could be a logistic nightmare because some of the earlier phases include individual students who will be coming back because they have IEPs or sixth graders and ninth graders who are coming back because um, because of that they're in that, that specific phase and they may be in in an art class that's a mixed grade art class. And I'm just wondering also now thinking more about how how this could be a logistic nightmare. And so um, I, I it was a very confusing motion and I guess that's all I have to say that it, I, I do worry about the logistic side of it now. So. Okay, next Ms. Pastor and then Ms. Falsey. Thank you. Um, just very shortly, this is why when we get into operations, we get in a sticky wicket because the children, for example, who are in CTE, they don't just come back to do culinary or whatever it is. They are taking classes, which means those other teachers that they have in the course of the day have to be there as well. And for us to make a decision, which is why I voted no, as a teacher, as a former administrator who understands scheduling, that when other people start trying to make decisions about how the school day looks, we really get into a bag of worms and we really need to stay out of that. And so I understand what Dr. Williams is saying completely. Thank you for that, Ms. Pastor. Next, um, last we have Ms. Calsey and then we really do need to move on. Thank you. And uh, I hear Dr. Williams uh, comments and the motion exactly says teachers will report one week prior to when their students return. So as the cohorts are developed and the phasing is done um, and the uh, principals look at their students' classes, that will reveal the information of which teachers will have students and then will need to report. So we're this motion does not limit who comes back. It limits when a teacher and a support person has students they come back one week prior. So that is up to the principal and the uh, you know additional administration. So it it <clears throat> I think it's clear and it's uh, it's representative of what was stated in the January 19th document. So thank you. All right, moving on. Next we have Mr. Offerman. Mr. Offerman, uh, I, 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 have, I have I've changed my mind. Uh, no, uh, no, uh, no question at this time. All right. Next we have Ms. Rowe. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a uh, motion which I'm putting in chat. I move that school system staff who apply for ADA accommodations based on any documented COVID comorbidity be permitted to telework and or teach virtually if their work duties can be completed by these accommodations. Second, Josh. Would you like to speak to your motion? So um, it's not clear to me because COVID comorbidities are a fairly new thing and they're a risk of death to people who get COVID who have them. And I don't think the federal government is going to update the ADA anytime soon in order to protect our teachers who have COVID comorbidities. And I don't want teachers to be fired because they're applying for an ADA accommodation and then they're told they don't have a disability or they're told that their work duties or that there's no accommodations they can have when um, within a very short period of time, they could be vaccinated, many things could take place that would allow them to keep their jobs. And so if it just means that they need an accommodation and it's possible for them to telework or teach virtually and they have documented COVID comorbidities, I think that we need to, as a board, make sure that that gap in the ADA is taken care of so that the school system understands that when someone applies for ADA accommodations, and they have documented COVID comorbidity that we want them to be treated like someone with an ADA disability. 
Okay, and it looks like there is a comment from Ms. Mack on Ms. Rowe's motion. Um, I support Ms. Um, Rowe's motion simply because for many, many people in the schoolhouse, the accommodation is to allow them to continue to teach virtually. And, um, it, you know, it is proven they've been doing it for almost a year now. So it's not an accommodation that the school system has never put in place. Just by virtue of us being virtual, um, that accommodation has already been accomplished. Okay. All right, next looks like we have a question from Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Ms. Rowe, I am, um, I, I need clarification and, and some understanding. You start talking about ADA, which is focused on disabilities and accommodations for disabilities. And then you are talking about um, um, health, um, you know, co comorbidities is, is what you, you stated. So I'm concerned that um, that we're, we're kind of merging these two ideas together and there's no legal standing, I believe, for the, um, the, the various health issues you're talking about being being discussed as disabilities. So I'm, I'm confused and I, I, do, I don't know if maybe the motion just needs to be modified to just say, provide accommodations for comorbidities and remove any language associated, associated with ADA. Please clarify that for me. So, and, so the ADA has procedures for accommodating things that are considered to be disabilities under the ADA. And what I'm saying is specifically in the motion that it's, it's very specific. I'm not saying every single ADA thing should be applied. The motion is worded very specifically. I move that school system staff who apply for ADA accommodations based on documented COVID comorbidity be permitted to telework or teach virtually if their work duties can be completed by these accommodations. It's literally that simple. So the process, you know, we have people who are already applying for ADA accommodations based on COVID comorbidities. The, that comorbidity will need to be documented by a doctor or medical professionals. But I think that there is nothing currently in our policies or in law anywhere that protects our teachers from COVID comorbidity. And I think that we need to do something. And I don't think we're outside of board authority to do this. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, Mr. Brusades here. Yes, uh, Mr. Brusades. Just to raise a couple points. Uh, I would be hesitant to make a uh, you know, quote unquote policy in this area. Um, the, you know, the, the number one reason or one is that determinations of reasonable accommodations under the ADA are incredibly fact specific and as they apply to the particular person. So it's, you know, ha having a, a broad brush rule sort of cuts against the uh, foundation of the ADA is that you have to look at individual circumstances and have an interactive discussion uh, with the employee about their uh, particular situation. Uh, second, the EEOC has put out several uh, guidance memos uh, discussing the impact of COVID on a variety of areas, including uh, ADA accommodations. So it's it's not like the law needs to catch up with this area. Okay, what did say? so. Um, uh, Mr. Brusetti, so then what is your suggestion as it goes about this motion? Is this the board stepping outside of um, its role or it sounds like there you have some concerns? I, I would be concerned that the board is that if the board passed this motion, it would be creating a process that could run counter to the ADA's 
individual determination requirement. Okay. Okay, that is actually very important to know. Um, anything I, else? I would, I would be very reluctant. You know, I, I, I'm telling you to give it second thoughts, third thoughts, fourth thoughts, and okay. probably don't do it. Okay, so then it. Um, so is there a way, Mr. Mercedes, to get where I'm trying to go to this without talking about the ADA? Can I can can the motion be amended in such a way that removes the ADA and simply says that I remove that school system staff who request based well, on documented maybe, COVID comorbidity? Perhaps, Ms. Rowe, maybe that's something you could work um, on separately. I'll, I'll just I'll just make the amendment now. I amend my well, motion no, no, it, to say well, that. I move that the school system staff who request accommodations based on any documented COVID comorbidity be permitted to telework and or teach virtually if their work duties can be completed by these accommodations. So I don't see how that was different from the. It removes the ADA completely. Okay. So then I'm going to make a now, motion. Now we're they're just applying to school system staff. Excuse for me, I'm this accommodation. Point of order. I'm going to move that we postpone this motion um, uh, because it of uh, the concern raised by Mr. Mercedes and perhaps Ms. Rowe could work on it um, a, a bit longer and maybe work on it, Mr. Mercedes, to get some uh, a, a better wording for it. So um, I do you mean do that in this meeting or like wait until now the teachers separate. go back to school or they're fired because they're going to get fired oh, if they don't Excuse me, Ms. Rowe. Ms. Rowe, excuse me, um, but I, I, I just move that we postpone it because I, I understand what you're saying. However, I think that um, we don't want to do something that could make us run afoul of the ADA. So, um, or, or, or anything like that. I think that these are very important things that we are discussing and um, they need to be well vetted. And based on the feedback from Mr. Mercedes, it doesn't sound, it sounds like this needs more vetting. That, that's all that I'm saying. Okay, so can I ask Mr. Mercedes a question? Perhaps you could maybe email him a question. We well, um, I don't have to do that. Back, I don't have but, a time okay, limit right moving now. On, I should be allowed to ask my question. We're moving on. This is now. There's a motion on the floor that's not resolved. Chaos. So we, I made a motion to postpone the motion. The motion is on the floor. No one's voted on a motion to postpone, and you're not letting me ask legal advice well, I'm about that to would allow me to amend me, the motion. Rowe, excuse me. So I've made the motion to postpone um, Ms. Rowe's motion. Does that require a second, Mr. Mercedes? Yes. Okay. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Second. second. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may, um, so then now, May we vote on that? Are we voting on the motion to postpone or are we voting on? You would be voting on the motion to postpone. Okay, Ms. Gover, if we could vote on the motion to postpone. Um, Ms. Ms. Uh, no. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Jost? Ms. Jost? Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Mohamza? Mr. Mohamza? Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Hume? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor is for it failed. Okay. So then it looks like there's still some questions about. So, um, Madam I'd Chair. Like to amend. Excuse, excuse me. Okay. <laughs> wow. Um, yes, I would, I would like to ask Mr. Prusades question 
about the motion before I make an amendment to the motion. We need members to come prepared with their motions. This is not where Mr. Mercedes helps you draft your motions during a meeting. We have a lot of different things that we need well, to get to, and this is just now. I mean, okay. Um, do you want to amend your motion, Ms. Rowe? I wish to ask Mr. Mercedes questions about the motion and then amend the motion. It's your motion. Why are you asking Mr. Mercedes questions about your motion? Because the only time I'm allowed access to legal counsel is in the meeting. Please do not raise your voice, Ms. Rowe. So, May I ask Mr. Mercedes questions me, and amend Rowe, my motion? Ms. Rowe, please do not raise your voice. This is a professional setting. We're all working to the, for the safety. Um, Mr. Mercedes, yes, Ms. Rowe, please ask your question so that we can move on. Mr. Mercedes, in what way can I reword this motion that will legally require staff to allow other staff that have COVID comorbidities to telework or teach virtually if their work duties can be completed in this fashion? in such a way that does not run afoul of the ADA. Will you please recommend a wording? I don't know that I can come up with any wording for that. You're, it seems that the, the end result is that you're looking for is to allow any staff member who requests it, who can provide a doctor's note with a comorbidity uh, issue uh, to be permitted uh, to telework or teach virtually. And that is a, a, a matter that doesn't square with the ADA's individual determination. The individual determination goes to the employee's particular health circumstances. It also goes towards the particular essential functions of the job of that employee. And that could be different for a math teacher versus an art teacher versus a PE teacher. So are you saying that this board doesn't have the authority to direct staff to offer telework and virtual accommodations to employees suffering from COVID comorbidities that they can medically document? What I'm saying is those are individual determinations that need to be made on a case by case basis if you're going to follow the dictates of the ADA. Okay. So we've gone I'm around about to separate this, this enough, from it, the ADA. It, okay, excuse me, Ms. Rowe. We, All right. I'd like, to, this, I'd like to amend so. I'd like to amend my motion. Oh my I'd like gosh. to amend it so that it has the following wording. I move that the superintendent allows school system staff to continue to telework or teach virtually if their work duties can be performed teleworking or teaching virtually and they have a documented COVID comorbidity. Okay. Um, so you're basically restating your motion. You're amending, you amended your motion, okay. Yes, I amended um, it. I am right. typing it into the chat now. Okay, Ms. Penn, yes. Second, I would like to offer an amendment to Ms. Rowe's motion. Um, Mr. Mercedes, how many amendments can we have? Because this now looks like it's the <laughs> third amendment. And how many times can a motion be amended? Because now we're going on the third. I believe it's two Twice. this time. Okay, and how many amendments? amendments? This is the so first we already have two amendments, so we can't do a third amendment then. So then we need to vote on um, it's her motion has been made and seconded, and we need to vote on that. Um, oh, yeah, is Miss well, let's see. Looks like we had some questions on Miss. Then may I comment? And that Dr. Hager was first, I believe. Oh, OK, then. Yes, Dr. Hager, please go ahead. I want to make sure I have my order right. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I actually had a, a question um, relevant to this from uh, the presentation, and that was um, that it was stated that uh, teachers could get a doctor's note based on 
some, whatever disability that they have that would mean that they could not come back to work. And so my question for Dr. Williams or, or uh, perhaps Ms. Lowry is um, are uh, conditions related to having active COVID on that list? Is there is there a list or um, or is, I guess is this again a redundant motion if if there's already a mechanism in place for a doctor's note to allow for te telework? Thank you, so Dr. Speaker. Uh, Ms. Lowry, would you respond, please? Yes, thank you. So. Ms. Hager or Dr. Hager, thank you for the question. We we do have a process where we work with our employees, and yes, um, they do submit doctor's notes or supporting documentation that um, identifies any health risk that they may have. Um, and again, um, whether or not you know they have the documentation is what we are looking for. And we speak with the employee, we speak with the supervisor that works with them. We review the accommodation that they are requesting because not everyone is requesting just to telework. There are other accommodations that they are requesting. Um, and we are following um, the guidance that is set forth with, um, you know, trying to establish whether or not it is an, an appropriate request. Um, and to the point that was made earlier, um, Every request has to be reviewed based upon what that um, employee's roles and responsibilities are. And if um, telework is an acceptable accommodation for that employee based upon um, their documented um, medical condition, then yes, they would be granted the accommodation to telework. But um, these are um, are issues that we look at on a case by case individual basis. And it is to the point that was raised earlier. It is an interactive process in that we do have to speak with the employee as well as the supervisor to gauge a better idea of what that employee's um, work duties are and what their responsibilities are and whether or not they could be transferred to a telework um, accommodation if that's what they've requested and um, then if if they are able to telework then what is the backfill um, at the schoolhouse level to then cover for that teacher if in fact that teacher were assigned to students that were coming in face to face so there it's a very complicated um, process and it is one that we do not take lightly um, and we do um, want to work with our, our teachers to make sure that we are keeping them safe. Um, we do understand the seriousness of COVID and um, all of the issues that come with that, particularly with um, our employees that do have additional health issues. Thank you so much. And my second question is for Lily uh, in clarification for the, the um, motion. Are you speaking about a, a COVID disease comorbidity like a long hauler syndrome where there's you know extreme fatigue and 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 difficulty breathing for months on end or are you talking about something that might put someone at higher risk for for getting covid oh both i'm talking if if you're at high risk for getting covid not just high risk for contracting it but if contracting it could cause you a higher risk for hospitalization or death or severe complications of covid uh, that's what I took comorbidity to mean is that there are people who have who if they get COVID, it could really be a death sentence for them. OK, I, I, I was thinking of it the opposite way as a, a, because, a comorbid you know, condition resulting from the disease. So, OK, thank well, you. Or pregnant women, for instance. Okay. Um, looks like we have a question from Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to ask um, Ms. Lowry to um, review the uh, Office of Human Resources. Um, she had mentioned it, <clears throat> where staff can apply for uh, administrative leave or um, other accommodations based on COVID impacts. There's um, it's FCR, Ms. Lowry, if that's I, I think what's one of the things that we're seeing from the emails that we're getting is that there are uh, a lot of mitigating 
uh, strategies in place, and there just needs to be a more wide communication to the staff, the teachers, and the parents, because there has been tremendous work on these plans. And uh, so I think there just needs to be more clear and, um, you know, communication uh, to to really share all of that. Sure, Ms. Causey, um, we have been communicating um, since last spring about the different types of leaves and the process for applying for our accommodation um, since we, again, since last spring. Um, when FFCRA was put in place, um, we shared that information because we had, while teachers were working remotely at that time, we had other staff that were still reporting to their job site. So um, we shared this leave. We have continued to share information about this leave. Um, the leave ended, the requirement to provide the leave ended at the end of um, December. And then there was the option to um, open it back up through the end of, of March. And we, um, uh, at that point, decided that we were going to continue on to apply that um, level of leave to our employees. And if the federal government decides to extend it, we will review it again at that time and make a determination about um, extending this leave. We have um, worked with our em employees and supervisors to help brainstorm some other possible solutions to work with our employees that um, have expressed, again, sheer just you know, concern out for their, their own health, for the health of their, their family and some things that, you know, we could offer in the way of resources if they did not um, qualify for a leave. We have employees that haven't worked with us long enough to qualify for a leave, but yet we still want to provide them with um, resources. We do th so through um, our employee assistance program, through Cigna, um, and through the staff in um, the various offices in HR operations. Again, we we don't take this lightly and we do understand um, the concerns that all of our employees have right now, um, especially the fact that the, the vaccine um, has not um, been available to some of them at this point um, and some are still waiting to get this the second shot. We understand all of that and we don't take any of that lightly. But at the core of every decision we make are those faces that sit in front of us in the classroom. And these children have been without their teachers and without face-to-face -face instruction for an incredibly long time. And to go back to some comments that were shared earlier, um, I'm gonna put my principal hat on for a minute. And I will tell you that every teacher in my building was a teacher of every child in that building. And they may not have taught them in the classroom, but they touched them in some way and they assisted in some way during the day. We need everyone in the high school, in the middle school, in the elementary school to play a role in bringing the children back in for face-to-face -face instruction. You can't stand up a school by having teachers only come in to teach just the students that they teach. They teach all children. And we love and appreciate all of our teachers. So again, we don't take this lightly. We have a process we have to follow. We have laws that we have to follow and that we have to abide by. And if we stray from that, we put our system at risk and we put this board at risk and we don't take any of that lightly. Thank you for that. Um, Thank you, Ms. Lowry. Next, it looks like we have Mr. McMillan. I, thank you. I just wanted to hear what Mrs. Lowry said, and, and she she took care of that for me. Thank you. Thank you. Next, it looks like we have Mr. Coon. I'm I'm sorry. I I, I don't have another question. I, I I'm looking forward to voting. Okay. Thank you. Um, looks like it's Miss Jose. Thank you, Miss Lowry. Answered my question quite uh, clearly and crystal clear. So thank you so much. Next, we have Mr. Offerman. Yes, uh, I want to protect every teacher who has, 
who has potentially serious COVID issues. My my concern is timing. Uh, with this motion goes along, I'm wondering if someone can address at what point a teacher has has to bring, you know, all this documentation and concerns to the appropriate people in terms of when their teaching responsibilities start. Thank you. That's all. So I can address that question for you. Um, as we are waiting for teachers to provide the documentation that they are, are, are required to provide, we work with them and with their supervisor. In the interim, they, they are expected to return to work and report to work, or they have to let their supervisor know what level of uh, leave that they're taking as far as how their time should be recorded. This is when it goes back to that process that where it's interactive. Our supervisors can tell us quite a, a bit of information pretty quickly to help us move the process along. But again, um, employees would be respect, expected to return to work or they would have to take um, some, some type of time, whether it's if they're a teacher, whether they're taking personal business or sick time, however the time is recorded. Um, or should be recorded. But again, we um, try to get this taken care of as quickly as we can so that we don't prolong it and the teacher has their answers so that they can make decisions. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, thank. Uh, uh, no, uh, no, uh, no further questions. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I just want to add to Doc, to add to Ms. Lowry. Again, with our fades in, we will need to know um, sooner than later because as Ms. Lowry mentioned, we're developing schedules and we need to know not only our students and who's planning to return and to do those cohorts, but also the staff as well. So as you know, March 1st was one time frame or staff returning February 22nd. Um, and then the next phase of March 15th. Um, so I would I would simply say that as Ms. Lowry mentioned, um, that communication has been ongoing since the spring and we need to know sooner than later um, about any documentation um, that staff members are providing so they can, so HR can do its work. So thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. So, I mean, I, I believe everybody has, has spoken once. Um, and really I have I have a question for Ms. Lowry, please. Um, I'm sorry. Did, did you already speak, Ms. Mack? Uh, I have not. OK, but uh, the one thing I wanted to um, just say is that there is an amendment that's on the floor and um, there, there, I don't know if that amendment was seconded. Um, I would just I, I in order to even vote, I need to have an understand under a procedural understanding from Miss Lowry. OK, yes, go ahead. Miss Lowry, are you adequately staffed to handle the volume, the potential volume of um, any type of leave that uh, FECRA, ADA, FMLA? Are you adequately staffed to handle those requests in a timely manner? Um, I will share with you if the requests um, continue to come in at the pace that we've seen them? I think yes. Um, if something should shift and we see um, an increase, um, then we may need to um, shift responsibilities around amongst um, staff within the office to assist um, with some of that processing. But right now, um, I anticipate that we are um, able to address the volume, yes. Thank you very much for that answer. Mm -hmm. OK, so I believe everybody has asked a question. Um, what, Ms. Hen, do you have a question? I don't believe we've heard from you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a question for Ms. Rowe regarding her amendment. Um, what I was going to suggest uh, or ask Ms. Rowe was about the time frame for the arrangement and if Ms. Rowe um, 
had imagined this being indefinite or if there were any parameters associated with this motion that she could speak to. I did not imagine this being indefinite. I imagine this to be, um, you know, at least through the summer so that we can get everyone vaccinated who wants a vaccine and bring community spread down. I didn't actually imagine we'd open schools this quick, but since we are, a lot of teachers haven't even had their first vaccine. So we have no help in place to save the employment of staff members who are now being asked to choose between potentially dying from COVID if they have other medical conditions that would make COVID more serious for them and losing their job. So if the board were to approve this motion, it would be in place for the current school year? Yeah. For Is that something I would that say could be stated in the motion? Um, I suppose once we process this amendment, you could amend it to add a time frame. I don't know well, if I can change an amendment already on the floor. I don't believe so, and it's already been amended, I believe, twice, so I don't know. It hasn't. It hasn't. This is the first amendment we're processing. Well, when you restated it again, you restated it differently than you stated it the first time. That, in fact, was a, an amendment. So, okay, so it looks like uh, we still have more questions for Ms. Rowe. Okay. Um, so going up here, it looks like there's a question from Dr. Hager. You said you have another question. I, I promise it'll be fast. Um, I just, my concern is that if we're talking about diseases that put people at risk for, for more serious COVID complications, which would include overweight and obesity, which is three quarters of American adults. So I, I have real concerns about kind of the broadness of um, diseases that put people at risk for serious COVID complications. When I first read it, I thought it was about kind of COVID disease comorbidities that result from long hauler syndrome and things like that. So I have, I have a little bit of concerns about that. And my question for Ms. Lowry though is, are pregnant women currently covered under our umbrella of um, potential exclusions for teleworking? If they have a um, doctor's note that indicates that they are at high risk because there are other um, issues related to pregnancy um, that are of concern, then they would be that um, would be processed and considered. Yes. Okay. Is there a blanket? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jones. Yes, thank you. Um, real quick, um, you know, I think we have to address the fact that there was a whole group of people pushing for schools to be open and go back. And now you're telling them to go back with less teachers and less staff. And principals have spent days putting their schedules together. And our class sizes are 25 to 30. And uh, there's a whole lot of scheduling that principals across the entire school system have worked on. And now for this board to go into operations when there is a system in place, as Ms. Lowry addressed, uh, that if people do have disabilities that the system will honor and they have to per the law. So it's all in place for us to go in there and, and gerryman, you know, just kind of jerry rigging this thing is not something I can vote on because I don't understand the repercussions. And it's also disrespectful to all our principals and staff that have been working so hard to get this plan going. Okay, and it looks like we have a question from Ms. Pastor. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, I, I've had a number of teachers who've asked me to speak out as, as an educator. I have to admit that I've been leery up to this point or worried about those teachers who are in this category about which Ms. Rowe is speaking. Tonight is the first time I've really heard and I've asked, I asked the question um, at another meeting, but Ms. Lowry is being clear about the documentation, about working with our teachers. I think we have to respect that. I think that um, if the system is committed to working with our teachers, because clearly we need to have teachers 
one way or another teaching the children if we're asking them to come back. So I think where we want to go is to offer an opportunity for staff to see how far, how broad they can take this in terms of working with our teachers who do have issues, who have reasons, whether it's theirs or their caretakers. But I'm hearing that. I'm leery about us as the board stepping into that, albeit I do think that we want to encourage staff to continue to look for ways to support our teachers if they can't come back legitimately because we need them. <laughs> We've got to have them for the children. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thank you, Ms. Christopher. So now um, we can vote on the amendment. Um, Ms. Rowe, could you read your amendment, please? There's been quite a bit of conversation. Yes, I will. I amend the motion to be worded as follows. I move to direct the superintendent to allow school system staff to be permitted to telework and or teach virtually if their work duties can be completed by teleworking slash virtual teaching and they have documented COVID comorbidities. Okay, and was there a second for that? I'll second it, Matt. I believe it was Ms. Hen. That was Ms. the original Scott. second. Okay. Yes, it was Ms. Hen. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so now if we could um, vote on the amendment. Excuse me, Ms. Scott, I have to step up. Can I ask Ms. Gover to skip me um, and I'll come back to it, but I need to come off for a second. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Gover, if you could take a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Tester? I'm sorry, Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Ms. Pastor? Has she returned? Ms. Pastor? Looks like she has not returned. Um, Al Marker is absent. Thank you. Um, favor is six. So it fails? Failed. Okay. Okay. And now, if we could process the motion, and um, Ms. Rowe, could you restate the motion? Yes. So the motion, since it was not amended, was I move that the school system staff who apply for ADA accommodations based on any documented COVID comorbidity be permitted to telework and or teach virtually if their work duties can be completed by these accommodations. And who was second? Who was the second on that? Ms. Causey. Mr. Mahomza? No, Mr. Mahomza was. Oh, That's right. okay, thank you. Okay, so now if we could vote on the motion itself, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. I'm sorry? Ms. Causey? No. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Jost? No. Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Mahamsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? Uh, no. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. 
favor of three, so it fails. Hi, are we still are we still on? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that was muted. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> Off the quiet. <laughs> Thanks, Um. Uh, so yes, what I was saying was that I was going down a list about people that had reopening questions, and um, the next on my list was Dr. Hager, just on the on the reopening. Yes, thank you. I just have a few questions um, for Dr. Williams and his team. Um, one is, how, what have you done to reach out to the families that did not complete the reopening questionnaire at all? So they didn't say they wanted to stay virtual. They didn't say they wanted to, to be hybrid. Uh, my concern is that those families are slipping through the cracks. And my bigger concern is that those families might be non-English speaking or um, harder to reach in general, and that we really need to reach out to them to, to make sure they understand that this is an option. So, Dr. Williams, I can actually answer yes, that thank question. You. This, thank is, you, Dr. Um, this is Dr. Jones, Dr. Hager. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so, to make sure that our, our families had an opportunity to opt into hybrid instruction, what we did was actually complete, um, have each school complete a link and a form by which parents can opt in, because what we found as soon as families begin to receive the date of hybrid um, instruction, then we had many families who wanted to be a part of our in-person learning. And so what we've established is what we, we're calling kind of an onboarding process and opportunities for families to opt in at various um, onboarding windows or at various um, windows of time so that they can enter in-person learning. So those that did not complete the survey had an opportunity to either um, fill out the form, be contacted by our school staff. We have school reopening teams that have contacted school staff, and we have also worked very um, closely with our um, communications office to provide our multilingual um, families and our families who speak um, multiple languages or our Spanish speaking families. You know, we have Burmese families. We have many, many cultures that we're very proud of in our organization, and we're hosting uh, reopening sessions actually this this week per zone and then system wide. There will be some Spanish speaking only sessions that will take place and then there will be um, multilingual opportunities for parents to engage. In addition, our um, our very own C um, our very own CAO and Dr. Roberts had the opportunity to engage in a Facebook Live um, conversation on Friday that provided reopening and hybrid information to our um, Spanish speaking families. So our schools are aggressively and excitedly reaching out to families who did not initially respond to the questionnaire to provide them with multiple opportunities between now and throughout the spring to re-enter re this hybrid learning opportunity. And I do appreciate that there will be ex an extended opportunity to sign on, and it sounds like there are lots of different efforts in place. I guess my concern is um, a lot of them are very passive, so parents need to log on, they need to seek it out, they need to answer the email. So are there more active kind of outreach to this yes. child A, child B, child C? Absolutely, child absolutely. Okay. And within within our zones, we're working with specific schools, and our 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 principals are amazing. I mean, they've been resilient. They're passionate. They are going out of their way to make sure that parents receive exactly what they need. Some of our some of our principals and their staff are actually um, filling out these forms for families. And the only reason we have the form because we want to make sure that we're keeping track of our students and making sure we're maintaining transportation. But families families are reaching out to our schools and schools are reaching out to our families in a in a very um in a very aggressive, like I said, way to make sure that this happens. So it's two-way communication 
And it's happening in a way that, like, like I have to say, that we are very proud of in terms of our principles and their desire to make sure that all families have a choice to participate in hybrid and person learning. So it is happening. Okay, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. It's something that I've been very concerned about. Yeah, um, and then I, I guess I'll just ask one more question because I know we're short on time and a lot of my questions have been answered so far. Um, early on when folks were coming back to schools, I heard some concerns about some administration, some fellow teachers who were not masking in school and not abiding by some of the, the rules that we had in place even last fall. Um, will there be some sort of a whistleblower hotline or something in place so that um, if folks are in a building and they don't feel safe because maybe the, the rules aren't being followed, some way that they can safely kind of get the word out so that there's a kind of refresh everybody's memory, like this is what we need to do to stay in this together, just to make sure that um, that everybody's following the, the rules that need to be followed. So Dr. Hager, I don't know about a hotline, but I will say uh, I'm working with our union partners. They, they made it clear we, we're over communicating about the mitigation strategies. I remember when you raised that concern about staff and I think you said administrators immediately we got together with the community superintendents and say, you know, we're going to follow the mitigation strategies, period. Um, and and so um, that's that's what that's what we know that in order to be safe, we have to do these things. And 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 so um, I don't know about a, a hotline, but folks are folks folks are not afraid of sharing information. You know, one way or the uh, or the other, we're going to get the information if in fact. Uh, someone is not following the mitigation strategy. So definitely, I know our administrators and our staff, um, they're excited to see their students and they're going to do what's necessary to, to be safe and to be safe for each other. So um, I hope that was just a, a dirty rumor that was going on yeah. uh, in previous months. No, thank you for that. And we know that masking is really going to be the, the biggest thing that we can do. So I really appreciate that. Those are my main questions. Thank you. Thank you. And I just would remind members of the lateness of the hour. These are all very important questions and but we still have other agenda items to get to and um, we do need to be mindful of um, of our public and their time and their commitment. So um, on my next um, here next, it looks like we have a question from Miss Jose. Miss Jose, did you have a question? No, I did not. Okay, um, next it looks like it's Ms. Mack. Yes, um, in the reopening plan on page 83, there is discussion about ventilation and there's reference to the fact that um, we have new schools and new schools were, were built to code. But my specific question is, since the start of COVID-19, has every BCPS school's HVAC system been inspected and if required, updated to meet both the newly recommended CDC and ASHRAE guidelines? Mr. Dixit, could you please uh, take that? Mr. Dixit. So I believe Mr. Dixit must have jumped off Ms. Mack. I cannot go into detail that, that he would be able to, but I can uh, say that all buildings uh, have been certified in terms of the uh, ventilation. I know we have sent uh, updates in response to that to the board. Uh, I can uh, revisit those updates and resend them out to you guys uh, this week. Uh, again, which will answer in more detail than I'm able to provide at this moment. You're on mute, I believe. We can't hear that question. For schools that have windows, are, are teachers going to be allowed to open the windows in their classroom? It, it's actually uh, the advice is that uh, windows in terms of ventilation where possible, it's best to leave closed, to be quite honest with you. 
but that's in conflict with the guidance that was given for buses to open the hatches and open the windows for circulation. It, the buses are a complete different situation as they have no true ventilation system in comparison to our schoolhouses, Ms. Matt. Thank you. I have one more question and I'll submit the rest in writing. Will teachers at the four public day schools have more robust PPE since many of the students at those schools may be averse to wearing a mask and because teachers at those schools may have increased exposure to bodily fluids? So that's a situation that I can investigate uh, in terms of looking specifically at what PPE those four non-public uh, day schools have ordered. I don't have that information readily in front of me, but we do have it. Thank you. I'll, I'll wait for your answer and I'll submit the rest of my uh, questions in writing. Thank you. Ma Just to add to that, um, Dr. Scriven, we were yes, planning sir. to open up the four public separate day schools in November and um, we did a walkthrough. I did a walkthrough with um, um, with Ms. Pastor, I believe, and we visited several, one of the schools, but we actually, um, the principal and the assistant principal show that there were additional um, e um, PPEs that were provided, such as the clear mask, such as the shield, um, gloves. So yes, we, for, for that response, um, as we were prepared to open in November, uh, we have purchased additional PPEs and equipment for those schools. Sorry, I'm, I said thank you, Dr. Williams. You're welcome. Thank you. And um, we have Ms. Pastor. Thank you, Ms. Scott. One quick question to Ms. Lowry. We didn't get in. We talked about accommodations for teacher illnesses. Uh, I think Dr. Hager asked about pregnant women, but there are a number of our staff members, our teachers who are primary caretakers um, for individuals in their homes. Uh, will they be considered as well? And what will they need to uh, show to that end? That's to Ms. Lowry. Or Dr. Williams, anyone? Hello? Okay, to Dr. Scriven. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Pastor. <laughs> Ms. Lowry, can you respond to that? Okay. All righty then. We will we will follow up, Ms. Pastor. All right, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Okay, thank you. It looks like um, we have a question from Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the um, reopening plan set number two response to board members questions, it's uh, number two. It, the question was in his last update to the board, Mr. Duke advised that certain teachers would be allowed to continue to teach virtually. Who are these teachers? What percent of total teachers does this represent? Will other schoolhouse staff be provided with this option? And the answer given uh, by staff was, Mr. Duke may have been referencing a request by TABCO to allow some teachers to continue to teach virtually while others were teaching in-person instruction in the school building. Requests made by staff for an accommodation to teach work virtually are reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. Is that in the MOU that is um, attempting to be finalized. No, Ms. Causey, I do not believe that exact language is is in the in the MOU at this time. And again, I would respectfully request to allow us to finish that process um, and negotiate back and forth tomorrow morning to try to bring some closure and agreement within that MOU. OK, thank you. And uh, to follow up, I, you know, all these emails that we got um, a teacher emailed and said that she's, you know, preparing to go back to her classroom, but she has a spouse that's also employee uh, in an office, not a schoolhouse, and that he's been able to telework successfully for this year. 
but he's called back to the office. So I just wanted to understand in our um, attempts to socially distance and uh, allow what can be done to be done, um, you know, in a modified way, is it an option uh, for staff to consider teleworking? I think I saw a statement um, in the reopening plan, <clears throat> but I just can't recall that. So uh, especially if people are on quarantine because of an exposure, they're not sick, they're, they're feeling well, but they have to go through that process. Um, so they're well and able-bodied, um, excuse me, but um, so is that an option of teleworking and or virtual instruction? Telework has to be considered based upon each individual employee and the job assignment that they have. Um, telework is, is not an option for every employee. A bus driver cannot telework. So we have to consider the responsibilities of each employee and what their duties and assignments are um, and cross-reference that to if they're requesting an accommodation, um, what is the medical documentation and reason for the accommodation that is being requested in order to determine whether or not we can then grant the accommodation that re they request. And if the accommodation can't be, re be applied, is there some other option that is available for that employee? That's why, again, it must be an interactive individual process. Okay, great, and thank you for that. And we understand that this past year has required flexibility, creativity, innovation, and just pure grit to get through. So I definitely understand uh, all of those forces at work as we try and make the best decision for our kiddos. Um, the next question I had was, uh, is, is there a way some of this, because um, we, we really do need to move on and I, I don't want to um, inhibit um, other board members time. Is there a way that this perhaps Ms. Causey could be emailed to staff? Uh, no, this is an issue brought up by many, many teachers and emails. It has to do with when teachers are reporting and students are in the building and teachers have school age children, uh, can their children go four days a week? a cohort D as it were. There's um, Harford County and Carroll County and I believe maybe Howard County that provide accommodations uh, to our teachers that have school aged children in Baltimore County Public Schools. So Ms. Causey, you raised the question before. Uh, we, we are looking at cohorts A and B and C at, at this time. Um, again, a bit, we're a much bigger school system with transportation. Um, so there was not a discussion regarding cohort, as you call it, cohort D. So is that something that has been requested for consideration? I mean, I just, it, it, you know, and I haven't gone through all of the 4,000 emails that we've gotten in the last week or so, but I try. Um, but there's definitely themes that are, are that are coming out. So, I mean, because in a lot of cases, the children go to the same school as the parent. We have that um, special permission transfer and so on. So if, if since that's come up before and it, it, perhaps Dr. Williams, is that something you could work with Ms. Causey on and, and, or, or email to us the, the answers to that? Because I, I, I do feel that um, in the interest of time, we really do need to move on and everybody has had an opportunity to speak and ask questions and ask more questions. And um, Well, thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, it's, it's not a matter of working with me. It's a matter of working with the bargaining units and staff. Um, well, in okay. order to uh, accommodate because no, of the thing is so. answering your question dr williams said you'd raised it before and i guess you didn't get the answer um that you wanted so it's being raised again so what i'm saying is is that i would i along with others on the board would like to hear the answer um so is that something that could be emailed to us so that we could all um know the answer to miss calls's question but again in the interest of time we still have an agenda to get through and and, and we do need to move along so um, 
Is that something doable, Dr. Williams? If Ms. Causey can share that question, um, I'm, it may have been a question that was raised already uh, okay. by one of our unions. So I appreciate if she would share that question with us. Okay, well, she could um, email it to you. So, but we do need to move on. Um, I, that, I, I've, I, I've shared it here. It's here in the meeting. Um, okay. My understanding is there's staff that's uh, yes. keeping track of requests and action items. And All right then. So, so then, then it's settled, it's shared. We um, So the next um, item on the agenda is, um, was brought up um, from Mr. McMillian and it was regard to in-person board meetings. Um, so um, I guess we would discuss the feasibility of that or um, Rod, was there something else you would like to add um, in regards to that? No, I spoke before. I'm fine. I, I don't mind if we just discuss it and vote. <laughs> OK, all right, Dr. Williams, can you share with us the feasibility of um, the board returning as, as staff prepared for us to have in-person board meetings? So I recall, uh, thank you, Ms. Ms. Scott, and thank you, Mr. McMillian. I remember when you asked that question, I want to say uh, earlier this year, um, now that we have additional clarity in terms of uh, what our schools will look like, uh, I think we can develop a plan um, to situate the boardroom, the current boardroom or that facility. Uh, so it's just a matter of developing a plan. And if I recall, um, the board wanted to see the plan a week or two before making any decisions. I don't know if that is still in play, um, but what we can do now is, is just to look at all the configurations and see how we can um, plan that for the board. A lot of it would be the technical aspect if those are just like what we're doing with our schools. If, if, if board members are still going to be virtual while, while others are coming in, we just need to map out what that will look like and any mitigation strategies need to clarify, et cetera. So we'll Dr. be happy. Dr. Williams? Yes, sir. This is Mike Zarch and I, I, we, back in November, November 5th, came up with a plan for uh, hybrid board meetings. We can quickly go through that. That says it, it and, and revise it, get it up to date. Uh, we went as far as doing a floor plan, having plexiglass measured for the, the tables. Um, we're in good shape with that. We just need to revise it uh, to the current uh, expectations and protocols. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Considering the lateness of the hour, Rod, could you re-read your motion, please? Sure. Thank I you. move the Baltimore County Board of Education allow board members the opportunity, excuse me, the option of returning to live meetings on Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hager, you have a comment on Rod, Mr. McMillian's motion? Um, yes, quickly, I, I I definitely support the the motion, and I have a question for either Rod or Mr. Mercedes or so, or whoever it may be um, about the committee meetings and whether they would fall under this umbrella. Um, and if not, my um, my hope would be that we could potentially consider having the committee meetings remain virtual, just because they are during the workday, and many of us have day jobs, and a lot of the staff who comes to those meetings they don't necessarily work. Um, you know, at the central office. And so if we could potentially consider keeping the committee meetings virtual just for ease of everyone involved, um, but definitely um, transitioning to a hybrid or in-person full board meeting. So would that be an amendment, something completely different, something we can talk about next time? What, what, what do people think? Uh, Dr. Hager, as I understand Mr. McMillian's motion, it just gives the board members the option of participating in a live meeting. So there could be some folks who decide to go over to Towson, some who are gonna phone it in. Okay, so for committee meetings and for full board meetings. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And um, also I wanted to check, um, who seconded Mr. McMillian's motion? 
I Madam think Chair I did, Scott, yeah. this was Ms. Causey. Oh. Ms. Causey did? Okay. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Rowe? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to know what, how will we do from the technology standpoint, some board members attending virtually and some board members attending in person? So I don't know if Dr. Zarchin can um, pull up what he had discussed and shared, um, but I know the technical aspect, we just have to look at it and see to be able to answer that question, Ms. Rowe. Okay, and my other question is, will everyone in the room be required to wear masks? Yes, when we did the plan in November, the expectation was that everyone in the boardroom would have to wear a mask. Uh, we also had uh, the expectation at that time that it would just be the board members and critical staff for the meeting, uh, no speakers. Um, they would be attended, encouraged to watch virtually. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. And next we have Ms. Jose. Actually, he just answered my question. My question was if, um, you know, we would allow in-person uh, public comments or people to come in and give comments if they had masks on. So it looks like no, and we still have the option of being virtual if board members don't want to come in. So thank you. Okay, thank you for that. All right, so um, we could vote now on Mr. McMillian's motion. Um, oh, it looks like there's still a question. I'm sorry, I was looking. Um, yes, Mr. Mahomes, if you have a question or comment, you could um, say that now. I wanted to comment after this vote, if it's okay. Um, well, usually if there's a comment and it's re regarding the motion, then it's done um, before you vote. Oh, it's, it was not regarding this motion. Oh, okay then. All right. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question was for Dr. Zarchin, and I may have missed if it if he said this. Um, the timing of Mr. McMillian's motion, is that adequate time to prepare um, the boardroom for us to return? And I guess that's my question. We would be able to determine that this week. Uh, one concern that, that I would have, and I don't have an answer for, is the technology piece. Uh, I can't speak to that. Uh, Dr. Zarchin, we have Mr. Corns on the line and he can provide that insight. Uh, Mr. Corns. Thank you, Dr. Scriven. Um, I actually was in Greenwood today working with uh, our uh, colleagues at BCPS TV and we've verified that uh, all the technology is in place to support uh, in-person uh, or virtual or hybrid board meetings. Great. Thank you, Mr. Corns. Okay. Thank you. Okay, if we're ready then, um, no more questions on Mr. McMillian's motion. If we could go ahead, Ms. Gover, and take a vote. Uh, excuse me, before the vote, I, I, and no. this is, I, I feel like this is important to share. One of the recommendations, again, this is back on November 5th, was that the duration of the board meetings uh, be kept to a maximum of three hours. Uh, we would have to work with the Department of Health uh, to, to see if that was something that was still, still necessary. Oh, okay. Was that Mr. Zarchin? Yes. Okay, thank you. That's a very important clarification. So, um, just to so that I understand, if we do vote to go back, we our board meetings could only be for three hours. How would that work for um, a committee meeting? Because I know we have building and contracts right before our, our board meeting, and I and together that would be much longer than three hours. So again, that that was a recommendation on November fifth. Um, we can follow up with our, our health services unit and reach out to the Department of Health. But I, I just 
felt it was important to share that before a vote. Oh, that is very important. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Madam, Madam Chair, I just want to remind the board, I recall the discussion. Um, thank you, Dr. Zarchin, for raising um, some of the work that was done previously, but I thought the board wanted to see the plan first before actually making a decision, you know. Um, so I want to go back to what Ms. Hen said, you know, the, the motion is for February 23rd. If we need a little bit of grace time just to work out the logistics and to get um, just some recommendation and then for the board to actually see what we're proposing, um, we may need a little bit more time. That's all I'm going to offer that. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I would like to ask Mr. McMillian if he would accept an amendment to his motion, if I may. Um, so to give the board a chance to review the plan and to allow staff the chance to um, prepare that plan and to give time as Dr. Williams suggested. Um, would Mr. McMillian be open to amending the motion to review a plan at our next meeting on the 23rd with a return at the first meeting in March? And I don't have that date in front of me, but. And if I could interject, Eric Brissett is here. If I could just interject for a moment. The it, it, it sounds like Ms. Hen, you're uh, seeking to use what's sometimes termed a friendly amendment. Uh, Am I following you properly? Yes, Mr. Persades. Yeah, uh, and well, it's often often used. It's not actually rec recognized by Robert's rules. So if there was, there would need to be an actual motion to amend uh, or a variety of mechanisms to put off consideration of this to get the information that Dr. Williams was talking about, like postponing to the next meeting, things of that nature. But I just bring up the friendly amendment issue at this point. Thank you for that, Mr. Proceeds. Um, so, Ms. Hen, are you offering an amendment to um, Mr. McMillian's motion? Well, I was offering a friendly amendment to Mr. McMillian's motion. Um, okay. So, um, so could you state what your amendment is, and then, um, and then we'll get a. My second. amendment is that the board would review the plan to return to in-person meetings on February 23rd with the intent to ret to return or have the option to return to in-person meetings starting with the first meeting in March. Second, Mr. Opperman. Thank you. OK, so it's been. Um, the amendment has been made and seconded. Um, so now um, can we vote on the amendment to Mr. McMillian's motion? Madam Chair, I have a, this is Ms. Causey. I have a comment to that amendment. You have a comment to the amendment? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, so I would just say that we just heard from Dr. Zarshan um, that he has the plan. He needs to uh, do a quick review this week. And then um, Dr. Scriven said that the uh, technical folks were in Greenwood making those arrangements. Uh, we have been talking about this since I believe Mr. McMillian brought it up first in August, and uh, I'm confident that they can um, make those arrangements that they've been planning and put them in place. And I think it's important um, for us to move forward. We're all moving forward. Let's all move forward together. Okay, thank you. It looks like Ms. Rowe, you'd like to speak to the amendment? Yes, so it matters to me that I was prepared to support this, but it matters to me that now we're deciding between limiting our meetings to three hours versus having some members attend in person. And we have never had only a three hour meeting. So I, I don't think shortening our overall work is appropriate. Um, so I, I just can't support any of this at this time. Okay. All right. 
So um, may we take a vote on the amendment? Miss, uh, Madam Chair, I had another comment to make that's oh. listed in the chat. Oh, sorry, Mr. McMillian, please go ahead. That's okay. If I'm not mistaken, originally when we voted on it, and I'm, and I'm not implying that people can't change their vote, but there were four people in favor, if I'm not mistaken, four people in favor, six said no, and two were waiting for more information. But that was months and months ago. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. All right, so um, <laughs> again, if we could um, vote on the amendment, Ms. Gover. Ms. Rao? No. Ms. Coffey? Yes. Mr. M Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Henn? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so that's in favor of the amendment. Um, now if we could vote on the motion itself as amended. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Clausey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Henn? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So moving on. Oh, sorry, Mr. Mahomes, that you said you had a question? Yeah, I just uh, um, had a, like, a motion. Um, since uh, the board voted earlier to include another work session, and since uh, it is rarely late in the night. Is it appropriate to ask uh, to postpone um, item uh, M, unfinished business work session on the proposed operating budget? Yes, that is it's, that is appropriate. So. Oh, and sorry, uh, item M and N. Uh, so that includes the board member comments, and then we can do it in a setting. Okay. So could you restate your motion? Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I move uh, to table items M and N, uh, unfinished business uh, work session, and uh, item N, uh, board member comments. I second, Offerman. Okay, thank you. And if we could take a vote on that, please. Madam Ms. Chair, I have a. Oh, I'm sorry. Discussion on that. Sorry, I heard two voices. Ms. Scott, this is Tracy. I just wanted to clarify his first motion was to postpone the item. So that is the one that's on the table, not table the item. Oh, OK. Um, he said Sorry, he wanted to postpone is more is appropriate. So thank you. OK. OK, so I, I postpone. Sorry. OK, got it. And then was that Ms. Causey? I heard. Yes, Madam Chair. Oh, OK. Yes. So um, while I understand it is uh, 11 o'clock, we do have um, the presentation that uh, Dr. Williams put into the uh, put into the uh, board docs just recently, and I think it would be helpful to hear that. I did have uh, a motion uh, that was going to be uh, short and I believe sweet and agreeable, and um, I had wanted it to do it at the at the prior meeting. So I would just like to consider us hearing the presentation from the superintendent, and um, I would just like to make one motion. Point of order, there is a motion on the floor right now to postpone. 
So which, does anyone? Yes, I understand that. I'm saying and that takes I, I don't support. All yes, right. I understand. I'm okay. saying I don't support postponement okay. because Dr. Williams got, and staff you. has. All right. Yes. Got it. We. <laughs> so does anyone else have any comments or any questions on um, the motion that Mr. Mahomes made? OK, yes, I'm chair, just to clarify, um, the motion is to postpone items M, N, and does it also include O? No, just no. M and N. Mm -hmm. Just M and N. Thank you for that clarification. Yep. OK. All right, so if we could vote on this, please. Ms. Gover. Ms. Gover. Ms. Gunn, I'm sorry. Uh, can I get clarification? Is Was there um, uh, an, a time to postpone it to? The next work session, which is the 16th, I believe. Thank, thank you. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Clausey? No. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahamsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Sorry, I was on you. Yes. Favor is eight. Okay, thank you for that. All right, then, so then moving ahead, then the next item on the agenda is consideration of agenda items for future board meetings. And um, we'll go around and start with Ms. Rowe. I have nothing right now. Okay, thank you. Ms. Colsey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to ask again for an analysis of the student counts projections. It, in a long-term fashion, uh, this has been requested multiple times going back to uh, Ms. Mack, I believe, six, eight months ago. It's also a critical issue currently with the MyI pass still ongoing. And um, while Mr. Mills from Canon Design offered to uh, do it for an additional fee, we have a very uh, highly trained and, and competent Division of Research Accountability and Assessments, who has prepared the student counts uh, book uh, for years. And it's really just a matter of addition, subtraction, and division to find out the accuracy of the projections uh, moving out from one year to five years to 10 years so that the board and the community can understand the basis, the accuracy of the basis of uh, the construction plan. OK, thank you for that. Uh, next is Ms. Mack. Yes, I'd just like to formally request that any of the deliverables included on the board goals document um, be plugged into the appropriate board meeting um, schedule. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. McMillan. Uh, can we please make sure that the coaches and athletic directors have the required uh, PPE prior to Saturday? Thank you. Okay, Ms. Jose. None at this moment. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Good night. Thank you. Ms. Head? Yes, I'd like to request a presentation on staffing and um, two to three year plan for staffing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Head. Mr. Mahomes? I have no suggestions at this time. Just thank you for a great meeting and your patience. Good night. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Mr. Offerman? Nothing at this time. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. No, Ms. no, thank you. All right. Mr. Kuhn. All right, I've got two items. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, I've said it before. Uh, I think we need to talk about AP tests across the entire enterprise to make sure we fully understand who has access to these classes and um, these tests. Um, and the other thing that I want to bring up um, for an item is something that piqued my interest from our last discussion. Uh, there was discussion of 
equipment um, that we spend money on every year in a 20 year performance contract at a total $6.6 .6 million for equipment. Uh, no further information was shared and I would like us to delve into that to fully understand it. Perhaps we can add it to building in contracts at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Dr. Hager. I have nothing to add. Thank you, Dr. Hager and last is me and um, I also um, do not have anything um, to add either. So um, I wanted to get clarification before a journey um, because our next board meeting that will be held virtually is Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. But we are going to have a work session on the 16th. And I just wanted to get clarification on that. And um, I guess Ms. Gover or um, I, uh, did we get a time for that or is that going to be at 6.30 as well? That will be at 6.30. OK, all right, so then uh, so then we will have a work session on the um, 16th at 630 and then board's next meeting will be held virtually on Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021 at 630 PM also. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight and the meeting is now adjourned. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone.